Hello, everybody. It is Chris Schmidt with Rocket Lasso, and welcome to Rocket Lasso Live, a live show that we do every single Wednesday. I don't know about every single Wednesday, but for season one, we're going to keep on going, see how long the season ends up being. Uh, it's a two-hour live stream where I take your motion graphics and Cinema 4D questions, and we try and just figure out the answers. Uh, oftentimes, the chat has a, an answer where we can jump in and do that. The focus today is going to be rapid-fire answers. So we're going to be trying to get through a whole bunch of questions, have a lot of people be able to squeeze their question in. Um, and that should be really good. I'm excited. Uh, I don't see any reason to delay, so I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the screen here. I'll be nice and tiny in the corner. Do you guys like it being tiny in the corner, or should I just disappear entirely? Because I often will start gesturing, but then I don't know if that helps or not. So, yeah, something to figure out. But we got lots of links going already. Thank you, everybody, for putting the links in there. Uh, everybody already knows that links are supposed to make sure that I can see the artist or the studio who made it. Otherwise, we can't tackle. And I randomly jump around and... Um, Randomly jump around and grab different links so I don't go in any particular order. So just don't spam the question, but feel free to repeat it if I've kind of got moved past it. Um, uh, Glanflav, what do you got? You got a link to uh, Instagram. And let's see, popped open the wrong window. I'll drag it over here. And let's see what we got. Well, first, oh, it's another uh, Oscar uh, uh, Pedersen one. We did one of his last week. I don't want to just keep uh, repeating off of one person. Oh, another really cool rolling one. There's a good chance that this the answer to this is just going to be the Roll It plugin. Um, but it's pretty cool. Uh, because we did one of his last week, I don't want to do... I don't want to spend any time on repeating on somebody else's. I don't want to keep on focusing on one artist. But, once again, very cool and really fun, unique movement. I would be curious if he has a specific way. Let's see if he says anything. Uh, loop, GIF, creative, seamless... Um, and he's not calling out anything specifically. At the same time, it's entirely possible you could just actually do that in Dynamics and just have it roll forward, and that might actually do it by itself. Um, actually, you know what? I know I just said we weren't going to do anything on this one, but let's just go and try and make a unique shape, because I think we can do this really quick, so it could be really fun. Uh, let's make a unique, weird shape, and then let's see if we can get Dynamics to roll down on it. Now, he had a couple of circles in one shape. But let's go ahead and do, uh, we'll do some circles, but we'll do them in like a pyramid type um, layout. So we would, uh, I'm going to grab this and we're going to, we want this to run really quick. So I'm going to hit NB um, so I can see the polygons here. Let's go ahead and lower these down. Something like that would probably be good. I'm going to make it a lot thinner. And uh, actually keeping the ring segment at about this amount, I think is probably pretty good. So let's see, what's a good layout to have this shape? And we need something that could still roll. So that could be where a little bit of the challenge comes in here. But my instinct here would be to make something like a cloner, drop it in there, and now we can make something of a unique shape. Um, so I would want to do like a radial. Like we might be able to do something like this, which actually is kind of interesting already. Um, so do something funky like this and just see what it does. So let's see, we'll do four segments, no, three, like th three would be interesting, but I'm not sure if that would even have the ability to roll. Although actually looking at it, I think it might. So you can see we get this unique, weird shape. I think there's enough, no, that's actually not entirely true. I'm not sure there's enough curvature here because if it falls on this flat side, I don't know if it could roll. It might hit this like flat part. So I'd be slightly concerned if this can actually roll, but you know, it's gonna be really quick to do this. So let's go ahead and create a connect. Throw into a connect so it's treating as one object. Right click, Cinema 4D, Simulation, or Rigid Body Tag. Let's make a floor. I'm going to move the floor down. And all we're going to do to try and get these rolling is take this floor, hit R for rotate, hold down shift, and let's do a 10 degree roll. So nothing too crazy. And on the Dynamics tag on our unique shape, why don't we just go ahead and tell it on the Collision tab, the shape, not to be automatic, but to be a moving mesh. And that should be all we need to do here. Let's go ahead and throw on a color here so we can actually see it pop out from the background a little bit. And hit NB, and why don't we even turn on SSAO so we can see some shadow. Let's hit Play. Oop, I guess we should put a Dynamics tag on the floor. Dink, copy the one that we currently have onto that. Should work fine. Hit Play. We're going to need more frames, 999, because it's quick to type in. Scroll out a little bit, hit play. Let's see what we get. It's a rolling flop, and then it's going to go. It's getting a little clunky over there. So that's why I was a little bit worried about. But why don't we go ahead, and because we made a very clean rig here, let's go ahead and add a couple extra segments on here. So now look at this very unique one. But now I think this is guaranteed to pretty much roll like a sphere, although there might be a little bit of uniqueness in the way it rolls. We're Now look, we're sliding. Do you see how we're sliding down the floor, which is interesting? Let's go ahead and grab both of our dynamics tags. I'm going to get rid of all of the bounce, and let's give it 99% friction. 
So that should really force it to be rolling. Now there might be a little bit of a lump there, but you can see that we are now rolling. Now this is perhaps a little less interesting because it's just a sphere. Um, so it's pretty much just going to roll like a sphere. I'm trying to think of any kind of unique shape that we could put in here that would really show off something weird and unique. Because, you know, I can do that, but that's just a sphere. We can push these out, but I don't think that would roll very well. Um, so it's kind of about finding a combination where we think they would roll. Actually, if we sharpen these up like this, we might get some more unique rolling because it might want to tilt off to one side. So if we hit play on that one, I think it would roll and then possibly hit there. But then here, I kind of hope it would tip over, although we are getting some, we're getting some reasonable angle on it. Um, you know what I'm actually going to do? Uh, let's go ahead and turn it a little bit just to force it to be in a slightly not perfectly forward position and hit play. And um, so just enough energy to roll. And my hope would be to tilt over, but it already has enough acceleration. Now, the next quick step I would do, and we're going to move on real quick here, is put on perhaps some angular or linear dampening to start sucking the energy out from the rotation. These small numbers won't do much, but it would hopefully stop us from accelerating too quickly. Um, so as long as we have enough to get over this initial bump, this will be constantly sucking a little bit of energy out. Um, and then, actually, oh, I just thought of something good. If we increase the gravity, so if I hit, I got rid of the, the uh, linear or the angular dampening, hit Command or Control D, go to Dynamics. Let's go ahead and crank up our gravity to be twice as strong. Really shouldn't change much, should make, but it should make it a lot more likely to tilt on its side when we get a particular angle, although I guess it's pulling everything down more as well. So does that not really change the equation? I'm not sure. I'm going to angle it less because we've got five times as much gravity, which is enough to stop that from wanting to tilt. So I guess maybe we would want to do whoop, too much. Whee! <laughs> it's out of here. Okay, hit play. Tilt just enough. No, oh, you know what? We're having a lot of trouble getting this one to go. I don't want to repeat what what he did in that one, but I would think that if we did just set this to linear and then tell every other ring to rotate 90 degrees, um, and then we separate them out enough, then we should start getting, I guess even his was just a single offset. So we would actually offset in this direction and none here. So if you get this kind of shape is more what he had. And I, I'm just curious if dynamics would Okay, the second one makes that a loop, so maybe it can just be two. Maybe there's something unique about that shape that, yeah, well, I didn't want to just make the one he did and try to find another shape, but it turns out that the unique shape of this is pretty important. And so if we were to just, like, drain enough energy out from here, um, I would hope that we could um, keep it moving at a slightly more constant rate. Yeah, you see it's not going crazy here. So I feel like if you just kind of baked this, you could probably get a perfect loop out of it. But I don't even know if you'd need a perfect loop. Like, just let it do one motion. So that one is doing its thing well because you get two round shapes. We could probably figure out another cute, cool, unique shape, but uh, that's that one. Uh, let's just give this a... I'm going to hit undo a few times and get the uh, funky star here. I'm going to save this version of the file. Let's go ahead and jump in episode six. Scene files... Number one, uh, rolling loop, I guess. Um, and then let's jump on in and grab another question. So let's see, jump on over. I'm gonna scroll up to get the questions again from the previous section. Uh, Cub, let's see what you got. Boom. Ooh, a pixely cactus from John. Let's see what we got here. Oh, that's a little bit of Intentionally rendered at incredibly low resolution uh, with no anti-aliasing. Uh, also fun. Now, um, okay, yeah, and even even here you can see he made two unique shapes and they're morphing between each other. It's really fun. Um, now, let's see. I, I'm gonna th let's, there's a couple different aspects here. Um, you just linked directly to it but not the specific effect you're interested in. So we can talk about a couple of the elements here, but I wanna make sure things are pretty different. Um, and I also really quickly am going to try and track down a scene file for you to show you, let's see. Uh, oh, there, no, not NAB, presentations, us by night. And I did a presentation um, with some morphing fruit I want to see if I can find it because that'd be a fun one to share. Pixel Rain Driving tutorials. I did not name these. 
the most clear. Lost by night. Looks like I might clean that up a little bit. Do, do, do. Um, bu, 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 bu. All right. Uh, I can't think of any way around this uh, to find it because I just named these in a way for a presentation. So if you'll allow me, I'm just going to open up the entire files of the presentation and we will do, 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 do. And let's see a little bit older there. Most blind stuff, most blind mesher, not the most blind, not the most blind. Nope. Targeting. Nope. Vertex maps. Nope. Weird blobs. Nope. Unless I just passed it with that weird circle. No, no. The pipe one's fun. Weird bottle, fracturing that. Cool, unique shapes. Some fields. That one is fun. Multi instancing. Look at this guy. Hello, everybody. Uh, volume modeling. Definitely not a volume modeling one. <laughs> cool, funky swirls. The candle one was really fun. I might need to extract that and do uh, something unique with it. Oh, well, I just blasted through all those and it didn't uh, jump out at me. Uh, search presentations for the word fruit. Because I made a bunch of... Ooh, is some, maybe something? Oh, I think I did blast past it. Uh, okay, so here is... Um, okay, uh, especially with us trying to blast through these. Uh, you know what? I'm going to start this one again proper. So we're going to go... Uh, let's see what was the question just in case we clip this out so uh what do we got here uh cube linked us over to instagram and that is bringing us over to john's I'll render here and we've got a really cool pixelated low poly very clean looking animation of this cactus so we're going to see if we can emulate a couple of the effects here now i it's going to take a while to make this morphing effect but i can go and explain it really quickly via a file I created a little while ago that I never really got a chance to show off. So what I've got here is uh, I created a, uh, a sphere shape from a cube a while ago. And the sphere shape, let me go ahead and show these. Uh, yeah, sphere shape from a cube. So we have the very, very clean polygons here. Um, and actually, it probably didn't start out as a sphere. It probably started out as something a little bit more shaped. But using this piece of geometry, I made this banana. I think it might even start with like a stem. So the stem was there and I made sure to morph it back in. And all I did was use like the normal, not modeling tools, but like sculpting type of things, move around circles. And I modeled using the same mesh, I made this banana. And then using the same mesh again, I made this pear. And using that same model again, I made this apple. So the point count didn't change. No new cuts, no new slices, didn't remove anything, didn't weld anything. It's all the exact same mesh. And then based on that, I probably would have taken it and gone and made a uh, like I would have made the apple first and then made a where is it a spherify dropped this into the spherify and if we put that into here you can see I can start morphing that really cleanly into this actually you can see it right there like by doing that I pretty much just made that perfect sphere from the apple and I would have just done a little bit clean up here because you could even say right now I could right click on this and say current state to object and then get rid of that so I still have my apple but you can now see I've got uh this made edible sphere, but the points haven't changed. So this would be a valid thing to continue modeling from and even just grabbing like this one little middle polygon, I can grow, 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 and hit MG and then smooth, 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 smooth. I'm uh, using the iron tool to smooth those out and you can see kind of the way that is smoothing out. There is a diminishing returns on that a little bit, but you can see that's actually doing a pretty good job of eventually as I, I'm doing it again and again and again, I'm hitting nuke again and again and again and again and again and again and again. You see eventually it actually did a pretty good job of smoothing the whole thing out. And then what I'd probably do is hit uh, UK to shrink it, T for scale. Don't scale on Y. Scale it, shrink it, scale it, shrink it, scale it, shrink it, scale it, shrink it. And now you can see how I'm really quickly able to morph that into something that's a little bit more usable. And now maybe if I did one more mg for iron okay not even too far just a little bit smoothing there and then i would run the spherify on it again just to make those points go right on the surface and boom i would have created my original sphere shape and it's always easiest to make a sphere you can make that easy from that deformer so having done that we've now got all of these different shapes for reference so all i did was take essentially a copy of the sphere renamed it fruit and then I made a morph tag. And then in the morph tag, I dragged the banana in. 
and then I drag the pear in, I drag the apple in. So now that all that's been done, I can go ahead and be viewing just this final fruit here. And let's unhide it and make sure that all the other ones are showing. And now I can grab these sliders here and I can morph it between them. So I can say a banana, a pear, an apple. And then, of course, we could keyframe all those back. Or these could go away and then that one could keyframe down. So we can morph in between those. Um, so that is the basic idea of being able to do that kind of thing. So uh, why don't we go ahead and do a really quick animation here. So we're going to start out. Let's start out with a banana. And then, you know, of course, this would be subdivision surfaced. Uh, so we got our banana, and then I'm going to record. Oops, sorry, misclick. Let's go ahead and record the banana at this time, and then let's go forward 20 frames, and then have the pair come in. I guess the pair should have been uh, zero at the beginning. So let's record that one. So now we can jump forward to the pair time, and at the pair time, that's when the apple should start, and we'll give it another 20 frames, and then the apple will come in, record that, and then at the it's going to start moving downward at the 60 frame mark but at 50 i'm going to have these two go down to zero so those can both get recorded and uh and now when we go up to 60 the other one should be ahead so when it morphs it should go back to a sphere shape so hopefully we just got actually it's not supposed to go to a sphere it's supposed to go to a banana but yeah we didn't ever start at the sphere so at the beginning i didn't want the banana to go to zero i want it to stay at 100. So we got banana, pear, apple, banana. Now it looks like I needed to have the apple. The apple wants to morph right away. So this in-between state, I'm actually going to move that really quickly in. So it doesn't even have a chance to do that. And it's going to go right from an apple back to a banana. So you can see we get that nice really quick transition. So that's the entire animation. It's only 60 frames long. If we want to make it looping, I'd actually make it 59 frames long. And now if I play, it's going to be a perfect looping animation again and again and again forever. So let's see if we can kind of get that little bit of an 8-bit thing going. I'm not going to worry about the colors right now. You could just keyframe the color to be matching um, as we went. I mean, I guess we could. It's going to take seconds. Let's go ahead and throw on a color here. We're only going to worry about a single color. So let's go ahead and make it yellow. Um, and... Slightly warm yellow. This looks pretty good. Uh, let's go ahead and keyframe that color at this time. And we're going to fast forward to the end time and actually go one more forward at 60 and keyframe that again because we're back to the banana. Although we're not allowed to keyframe something that's not exposed, so we have to go one. Now I can keyframe it. So now we know if we jump to 20 frames, we get the pair. So let's just make it a green pair. Something like that. Maybe a little darker. There we go. That's that color. And let's jump over to 40 frames when we're at an apple. Of course, we'll just go nice red here. We'll make it nice and crisp. Pretty red. Yeah, we'll just go cartoony with it. So uh, those are all morphing. And now we can see that we got the color changing as well. So nice and straightforward there. Uh, let's go ahead and grab this and see if we can get a little bit pixely. I'm going to go ahead and save this into our sharing folder. You get these files if you are subscribed on Patreon. Let's go ahead to episode six, scene files, and we'll just call this number two, and we'll call it fruit morph. Uh, and now I'm really curious in this pixel style. Um, so we're going to use a standard renderer, and we're going to make our resolution pretty dang small. So uh, let's go ahead and make it square. So I'm just going to say, I don't even know what we want. Let's say 100 by 100. So this is also going to render really quick, so that's another advantage here. So we could render like that out to the animation. I'm going to say render one less frame. Um, but we also want to go to our anti-aliasing because right now if I had to render, and I guess we want to make sure that these ones are not rendering. That's my fault. Okay, so um, when it's rendering, even if I, let's go ahead and send this bit to the picture viewers because it's going to go so fast. We can scroll up here. But you can see it's anti-aliasing. It, look how quick that render is ridiculous. But you can see that's anti-aliasing. So you can see that it's, it's got clean pixels on the edge. We don't want that. So I'm actually going to say anti-aliasing, none. So hopefully it's not trying to clean that up at all. So let's go ahead and render that again and see what we get. And there we go. Uh, now, even though we went with none, I still feel like we're getting a little bit of a transition there. Actually, I'm not sure. You see it's really sharp on the edge. So I guess that's probably just the way it's being colored on the edge. So that's actually working pretty well. So we get this nice pixely kind of look going. We could probably put in some sort of uh, additional effect. We can make it a little bit cartoonier even in the viewport where we might be able to do some sort of uh, cartoony type shading 
which might help. I don't want to spend too long here. We're already using the color channel here. So what I might do would be, I'm not even going to look at the reference anymore because I don't want it to be exact on there. But let's go ahead and put a compositing tag. And on the compositing tag, I'm going to tell it to be compositing background, which is going to make it completely flat. Um, but why don't we go ahead in our render settings and turn on maybe some ambient occlusion. And the ambient occlusion, why don't we go ahead and twirl down our gradient. And I'm going to select all of these. And actually, let's make a couple segments here. I'm going to grab that and then that and then that. I don't say that's probably too many. I'm going to get rid of that one, get rid of that one. Yeah, we'll do that. And let's go ahead and select all of these. Hold down Shift and grab all of them and say uh, Step. So you see we're stepping between them. And of course, we need to pull this over so we actually get the white one. And a little bit, get the white one. Deselect them all, hold down Shift, and just distribute them a little bit better. Just eyeball that. But now, even our ambient occlusion should hopefully have some kind of, uh, what do you want, like a stepped look. Uh, so I'm just curious what that looks like. It should, once again, render incredibly fast. So and it's only going to be showing up at the top here. So yeah, just a little bit of a hint of some shadow. Um, but now in our material, uh, what I would kind of like to do is go into maybe our luminance channel. And I'm going to feed in this kind of an old school technique is um, I'm going to go into effects and make something like a Loomis shader. So what we're doing is essentially piping in a specular type of shader into uh, the luminance channel. I'm gonna say no shading, uh, and I don't want specular two or three, I just want them on this one. So what we do is go into this one, and we've got our different controls here. Um, so let's see, I haven't used this one in a while, but we can go and crank up our intensity, so that one's really bright. We've got a size here, so you can see how bright that gets. Uh, it's kind of behaving a little oddly in this uh, physically based window. I don't know if we can change that here. Project settings. Um, yeah, interesting. Uh, but they changed it. This didn't used to show the ref reflectance workflow, but now in R20 it does. So it makes this one look a little bit different. Um, but we could probably go and crank up the contrast here. And yeah, now you can see that we've kind of just by having a full contrast of 100, there's no gradient between it. So we just, just have this bright highlight going on there. So if we were to make a light uh, and let's scoot the light. I'm going to keep it real simple. Let's just scoot this forward. Uh, let's just hit render. And there you go. Just boom, one big bright highlight. Uh, I could go and maybe pull a little further, maybe make the highlight a little bit longer. Cool. Uh, undo the view, and let's go ahead and render again. There we go. Now we got this. Oh, look at that. That is looking pretty cool, actually. So now we've got these tiny little kind of GIF-like animation, and there's no transition between those colors. And then uh, I think the final idea would be you could take this and then blow it up, you know, go into something and make the final output here bigger or even something like this. If I was just to screen capture this as it's playing and then you make your final output much bigger than the, uh, the original small version. And I do think a little bit of shading on here would go a long way. Um, even uh, even that, I mean, just because we're having a little fun shading, and then we jump to the next question. But uh, we're already controlling the color here. But we could actually throw that entire Loomis shader in here as well. I'm going to save it here because it's really worth stopping. But just as an example, I'm going to get rid of the highlight, and it won't be changing color. But if I put the same type of Loomis shader here, and we just let the shading fall through, we're in the color channel. Um and I could not worry about any of these, actually. We'll just put the entire Loomis into a, uh, what is it, the posterizer. Where does that hide these days? Posterizer. There we go. So now you can see it's only going to do a certain number of levels there. And that's in the color channel, which should be flattening everything. I'm going to temporarily yank the uh, selection tag off there. And let's just see what it does in the viewport. So, yeah, then you can see how it's... Uh, transitioning from one color to the next to the next. So in the posterizer, we could make sure that we do no transition. Let's do one less level. And of course, this entire shader, we could go in and change things like based on the shader, like give it an illumination of 100. And if we're changing the color, this could just multiply on. Actually, that's what we could do is um, multiply that based on our color. And we might be able to pull back our selection tag. Yeah. So you can see that we are getting some of the color and highlights in on top of it, and then we could just make sure that um, it never gets to black. Um, so we can lighten that up a little bit. And it does get to black here because it's being colored by the light, but we could uh, put some additional illumination in other places. 
perhaps we could pull this one back. Whoa there. Pull that one. I know it's snapping all crazy like that. But yeah, we, we could do some additional lighting or you put a little bit of a luminance in here. Uh, clear that out and do like a little bit of yellow, morph the same color. I don't know there's a million ways to get a little bit of the color in there so it doesn't get flat. And you can get that, this additional kind of lighting effect going. So you have more detail, but it's still flat. And then once you go and you do the pixelated version of it, uh, the luminant yellow is going to be weird. But as soon as we do this, you can see that we're getting some shading in there, but we still get the pixel effect. Um, so all, all that's straight out of cinema. And I think it's working pretty good. Uh, I do like the shading, but just kind of stylistically, I think I liked, uh, I liked it a little bit flatter here. Like one layer of shadow might be kind of fun. Um, but that's pretty cool. I like that. Um, and it's in shocking, shocking how fast that renders. I'm going to go file, revert to saved, and let's just see how quick this renders. I'm going to say render and go and doop, 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 done. Like all that's rendered. So pretty fun there. Um, okay. So let's jump back into the chat and find another question. Thanks for that one. That was fun. I'm scrolling to the bottom, see if there's any new questions. Um, looks like some people are chatting amongst themselves. So I'm not sure which are for me. Uh, Ralph says, question, how do you make a smooth tube with an inserted clip without messing up the smoothness like the button on a Wacom? How do you make a smooth tube with an inserted clip without messing up the smoothness like the button on a Wacom? Now, what I'm assuming you're talking about. Let's go and jump onto the full camera here. So I've got my Wacom pen right here. And let's see. Let's see if it's going to, I can't bring it into focus here because it's going to go way out of focus. So I got to pull it way back here. But you can see where that we have a button and it's transitioning in and there's kind of a bit of smoothness on it. This is actually an excellent question. And stylistically, it's something I really love doing in modeling. I think it's just kind of a cool style. Uh, so let's jump into cinema over here and look at it real quick. So we're not going to go too fancy on the actual button here um, or the overall pen. But if we were to make a cylinder shape and give ourselves a couple of subdivisions. And also, let's keep it pretty low poly because you can just keep everything a lot cleaner doing that kind of thing. So let's go ahead and make this taller. I'll say four, let's say 400. A couple extra height segments. There we go. So now we got something to work with right there. I like that. So let's go ahead and make this editable. And if we were to put this in subdivision surface, you see it's going to smooth out the entire thing. We should probably weld the caps, select all the points, optimize. Those are welded. So now you can see we got a nice smooth overall shape. So if you want to model in something like the Wacom pen button, let's go ahead and say that this is where the button is supposed to exist. I'd kind of like to do it on the orientation there. It's actually these. So let's say that's where the button should be. So, um, I think that you, we can maintain the smoothness just by making sure that we maintain the integrity of kind of the polygons as they exist here. So we hit it D for extrude and just extrude in. And you can see where it's going to kind of get this sharper curvature going along it. So you can see where we are. It is sort of messing that up. And now we could, if we smooth this out more, you see we are still going to end up with a pretty smooth final mesh. But we can start pushing this a lot further by adding additional cuts in certain places so they can transition better. The reason the smoothness from this side over here to that top side, why they're different, is because the distance that this is smoothing from there to there is a lot smaller than the distance from here to here. So if we were to do a couple cuts, let's hit uh, edge mode, M or U, B, U, B, to do a, a ring selection. I'm going to do a ring selection there and a ring selection here. And now hit M, F, which is the edge cut mode. I'm just going to do a single cut. And let's make sure we turn off end gone. So now you can see we've got cuts on there. Now that we've done that, now just visually, almost coincidentally, they're a lot closer al already. But I guess what I would do is hit U, L for a loop selection. Grab that, grab that. T for scale. Let's scale those in a little bit closer to each other. So now the distance from here to here is about the same as we just put in from here to here. So with any luck, that is now the curvature on the top is a very similar to the curvature on the sides. So right there, that should be helping quite a bit. I am noticing that the way it extruded inward here is a little weird. I don't know why it kind of went clunky there. Uh, I don't have a great way of fixing that, except if it was in the moment when we saw it. I mean, we could... Uh, we could fix this. Okay, here's a good way of fixing, actually, because we're just doing rapid fire here. Um, right now, it's let's just assume, well, here is the proper height. So I'm going to copy that as my Y height. I'm going to grab this point, and I'm going to snap it 
uh, to this one. So it shift uh, shift S is the uh, turning on snapping. So if I move this, we should snap to that point. Now it's not gonna weld it, but now that is exactly in line with that point below. And now if I paste back in my Y position, it is back in line and it's a perfectly straight line up and down. Just a way of cleaning up that weird extrude we got. I don't entirely trust the edges on the, that extrusion, but let's just carry on. Now, if we wanted to sharpen this up even further, that's working well. Uh, we got a couple options. First of all, let's make a loop selection around, let's see if it'll let me do one. Um, yeah, there. The, the, you just have to find the right spot to actually do the loop. So you see right there, the curvature is all working pretty well, but there is something called, let's see if we get when we right click. No. It's actually a tool that is a little bit hidden. It's a little bit of a pain to find. Uh, commands, maybe? I am looking for the, there it is. Uh, under Mesh Transform Tools, there is Weight Subdivision Surface. The shortcut is MR. As we were talking last week, if you want to learn a shortcut, you have to just force yourself to do it. So, it's, so instead of clicking the button, I'm going to hit M. R and I start building up the muscle memory of where that is. But anyway, I can now start, I can just click and start dragging on the screen and you can see we can transition into a hard edge on that. So you can see, boom, those are now a lot harder edge there and it looks like it's doing a pretty good, pretty dang good job of maintaining that curvature. So if we were to zoom out here, look at that beautiful hard edge where we're transitioning one shape into the other, and that is looking great. I'm gonna hit undo actually. Let's also do a loop selection on that one and hit MR, and we could sharpen both of those up. And now look at this beautiful shape that we just got out of that. It's almost like we disconnected them. But having done that, we can hit undo, and let's uh, let's bevel those again, MR, or not bevel, but let's uh, weight the subdivision surface. But this time, why don't we just weight it not quite all the way? So I'm gonna pull it in, but not quite all the way. We'll leave it a little bit smooth there. So now, I mean, we don't, the subdivision surface isn't giving us quite enough subdivisions for this to look great, but you can see how we're getting uh, a sharper curve, but it still turns. Now, let's uh, get rid of this tag and go back to just being smooth. Let's say we want to do it manually without the subdivision curve. Something we can do is hit UB, and I'm going to grab all these inner ring selections. You can see I've got that entire loop of them traveling around there. And now I'm going to hit MF to do a cut in there. So I can cl click like that, and you can see I've got that cut. But let's see what that is actually doing. I'm going to hit undo, and let's subdivision surface. And now let's hit apply. And the instant I do that, it just made it significantly sharper. That whole section is a sharper curve based on the one we the way we subdivided as an alternative what i might do is hit mf and do additional subdivisions so i might say let's subdivide three times and i can see that made it quite sharp but it did create some redundant polygons so i would d dissolve some of these other ones uh, i just did that to get an even subdivision of one two three cuts you can see one two three so i could do a loop selection and grab that one and another loop selection ul grab that one it, let's say the back part's still supposed to be smooth do that and i could just right click and dissolve which the shortcut now is MN. There didn't used to be a shortcut, but that will get rid of the points as well. And now you can see that the front edge is going to be significantly sharper, nice and sharp up front, but the back still has a really smooth transition. So a lot of this just turns into stylistically how you want those to behave, and you can dramatically change the way those look. And even here, uh, and we'll end it here, is if we were trying to also model the button a little bit, we could just grab these polygons in the back. I'm going to hit UP. Uh, to split those off and hit delete on this object. So you now see this is a separate little extrusion I've got here, a separate couple of polygons by themselves. I could just hit the letter D for extrude and we can extrude that out. And now you see we can pull a button back in here. And if we were inclined to hit D again and get a second extrusion, you can see that one becomes sharper based on the very nature of what we just pulled out. And you know, if you wanted the clean curvature on the sides again, we could grab these three points here, maybe grab the three points there, pull those more forward. And you can see we can start, oop, I gotta turn off snapping, shift S. We can pull these and sharpen those up a little, and you can start getting those button shapes or T for scale and pull them down. And you, you can just see where you could start being able to pull this in. You see, actually, it's bulging out a little bit here. I don't, it might be the extrude that did that. Actually, I almost guarantee that there's some extrude weirdness. Yeah, the extr these extrudes are not lining up the way I want them to. Probably have chopped it in half and done some sort of symmetry. I'm going to ignore that. Oh, man, what did that do? Yeah, this, this extrude was way off, but, uh, I'm just going to eyeball it and slide that back. Uh, unless, or I might have accidentally grabbed that point, to tell you the truth, so that might not be the extrude fault. Um, even though it did do weirdness on the inside. Uh, but yeah, uh, even here, I would probably grab these polygons here. 
and go T for scale and scale those in a little bit. And I even hold down shift and convert my polygon selection to a, the current point selection and then deselect those middle ones. Uh, hold down control, which will deselect them, T for scale. Scale that in a little tighter. Um, and yeah, and, and once again, like tiny extrudes are what's going to sharpen this up for you. So I do another I for inner extrude. And in pink, you see instantly that made that very sharp. And look at that beautiful curve we're getting off of that. Like that just, I want to click that right now. Like that is just begging to be clicked. Um, so yeah, a bunch of different ways of transitioning this. Um, and even, you know, once again, stylistically, if we were to grab this top one, if we pull down this subdivision here, like maybe this loop, let's get let's erase out this loop. So M N was dissolve, and now you'll see that there's more of a curve for that one to transition down and out. Um, we could even grab the next loop here and pull it down further. And as I do, you're going to see that this is stretching, which is making that a smoother transition. So if you want, I'm going to undo because I liked it a little bit better, sharper there, but. Um, Stylistically, it's pretty straightforward to go and do those kind of modifications. Um, you know, grabbing this inner one here, we can grab those and pull those further back, and that's going to introduce a lot more curvature. Actually, that one's doing the most difference here. Pull that in, more curvature, pull it out, and I can see that that is a smoother curve down there, and there's a nice sharp one up there. So the closer you pinch those lines together, the sharper that edge will ultimately be. Um, so, yeah. So uh, that's pretty much it for that one. Let's go ahead and give this one a quick save. And we'll just call this one number three. Uh, post more questions in there if you want me to get to it. If it was already up on top, feel free to post it again on the bottom. Pen button. All right, cool. Uh, that was a fun one. I like these little, these little modeling challenges. Whack em pen. Hopefully that answered what you're asking, Ralph. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Let's see. Um, thanks for more links, everybody. What do we got? What do we got? Um, what else do we got hanging out here? Let me see. Jump over here. Um, so we got Lasered, Paul, uh, MW. What's going on? Motion process. Welcome, welcome. Oliver. Um, who else is hanging out here? Bee Heaven or a Bee Havana. Uh, Picaro. Hi, everybody. How's it going? Um, okay, uh, jump around. Let's see if somebody has a question that I didn't already do. Did I do, already do one from typo? I don't remember. I'm gonna click it. Let's see what we got. So hopefully it's somebody that we didn't already. Uh, oop, a little bit of a, little bit of a. Uh, I don't know why this download thing is popping up. That's annoying. Uh, this is from Fa Niar. So it could be Fanny R. I'm not sure. But let's see what we got here. Um. It's another, or it's a, yeah, a kind of a 300 or a 36 days. Um, well, let's see what we get. I don't even know what we're looking at yet, so let's not worry too much about it yet. Um, well, let's see, we just, we got some tubes, and they are inflating. It's kind of just, there's a little bit of a pop in there. Pop! And then they're inflating. Um, I think we can do something really quick here. I don't think it would take, uh, I don't think it would take a ton of time. Um... So, uh, very neat. Uh, I like the transition of colors here. Uh, but let's jump into cinema and see if we can make something quickly along these lines. Um, so, my thought would be, let's make a couple of... Um, let's see, what's a cool shape to do here? We could do a series of stars. We could do uh, a helix, maybe. Let's see, if we make a helix and we flatten it, and we give it no height, so we just get this swirl. Then we can increase the number of spins, and we can let those in, that intersect. In fact, why don't we copy that, and then I'm going to paste it, and we'll make a second one uh, spun 180, and now we got two of them. But then we can copy and paste those, and we'll spin it 90 degrees. And now we got four of them, and none of them should be really touching. In fact, if we increase our inside radius right there, then yeah, that should be that should work pretty well, and they shouldn't be bumping into each other. Now, um, right away, let's go and um, a couple different things we could do. Um, we could. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut back on the swirls here. We want this to run quick in the live stream, so we'll cut back in the number of swirls, uh, and then we could put this into a sweep. 
But I wonder if it'd be more fun to put into a volume. Let's do it. Yeah, why don't we do it? Um, in fact, why don't we go extra fancy? We'll put this into a volume, but we're going to make it a fancy. We'll, we'll take it a little bit more complicated. I like that. We're going to put all these into a connect. I'm not sure if this will work. And then I'm going to make a MoGraph MoSpline. What you say? Well, we're going to change the spline, the most spline, to spline mode. And then I'm going to go to the spline tab, and I'm going to drag in a source spline, which is going to be the connect object. And let's go and hide these and see if our most spline is outputting it. And it doesn't seem like it is. Now, out of curiosity, if I were to drag in a helix, will it? And yes, it does, which means it doesn't like this connect object. Let's see if we can force it to like the connect object by putting the connect object into a spline mask. We'll hide the spline mask and tell the most spline to look at the spline mask. And that indeed did trick it. So there's a there's a thing, uh, a new, uh, here's, a, here's a new catchphrase for you guys. We are, I always say, when in doubt, use a connect object. But when you're doing spline stuff and the connect object isn't working, when in doubt, put it into a spline mask. Because it was making it so that the most spline wasn't viewing the connect object as a spline, but you put it into a spline mask and it's like, oh, it is a spline, okay. And now it did indeed do it. So now we've got that going, let's go ahead and create an end side and a sweep. And then we'll put the end side and the most spline into the sweep. And now you can see that even if I were to scale up this end side big or small, nothing's happening. And that's because our most spline has taken it over. And so it comes with its own rail. So if I were to scale this up, you can see I can, I can actually scale up the thickness of this based on not the sweep, but based on purely the uh, width here. So let's go ahead and change our, our mode here. And you can see the way our count is pinching and I want more of an even distribution of points. So let's do that first. Let's grab our helixes and I'm gonna change it from adaptive to uniform. And actually, maybe that's based on the spline here. Can we change the type of spline this is? Uh, spline, vertex. Count. Oh, okay. We can do it directly inside of the uh, most spline by changing it to the count. And now we can change the exact number of points that are spinning around this thing, which is very useful. Now, uh, we could go and do this right now like this. We can just do it where we have these very, this is very clean. It's very square. You see all these polygons are very square. That's the kind of thing I like to see. Um, uh, but I guess just to throw it out there, we could also do this setup. And let's temporarily turn that off and we'll make a copy of the most spline hide the originals. Uh, we could also go and make a doo, 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 um, a volume builder. And we're going to drop in the most spline. And we'll put, um, let's see, what do we need to do here? In the most spline, I'm going to tell it that has a density of one. So it, has, it should be viewing a bunch of points. And this voxel size might be too big. So yeah, if I drop this down to five, you can suddenly see we are getting something. And now, and we have to change the density because it's kind of, uh, it's like how many little times is it checking the uh, surface of the most spline. Now, if you have dragged in splines, let's do it here. If I drag in a spline inside the volume builder, you'll see that the volume builder actually has two settings. It says it's got the density and the radius, but uh, it is not doing that on the most spline and is not asking us about the radius of a most spline because it's feeding in directly whatever we're feeding this width, this width in to be. So I'm going to grab our builder and let's go ahead and shrink it down a little bit. Let's say down to two and I can see it's become quite detailed. And what's cool and is in the most spline, I can twirl down our width here and we could shrink these and I can actually make it thinner or thicker at different parts here. So why don't we thin it out a little bit on the edge? We can't go too far because it's going to erase it out. And I don't want this to be incredibly high poly. And I do also want to make sure that these aren't quite touching in the middle. So why don't we go ahead and grab all of our helixes and increase our inside radius. So as I tick this up, and we might need to go a frame forward to force a refresh. I'm not actually sure what we need. Okay, I turned on and off the spline mask, and that finally forced a refresh. Now, let's go ahead and make a volume mesher. Throw that inside there, and boom, we've got a mesh going around. And you see we actually are getting this getting thinned out everywhere. Now, it is creating a significantly higher poly count, and the, if we want it to be lower, we have to increase our voxel size. And as we increase our voxel size, it is indeed making it lower poly, but now we're losing more of our tail because the tails aren't detailed enough. That's fine. I'm going to let it go down to this point. Let's go ahead and throw in a smooth in here. We have to use a light touch because as we smooth that, it's also going to thin it out and make it disappear. Um... And then we could also make a smoothing deformer and then make that a child of the 
volume mesher as well and you'll see that this is smoothing out those existing parts as well so i just want to throw out there that we also have this cool options with a volume mesher but let's keep moving with our sweep here and i i think we should be able to change the yeah we can also change the thickness of our sweep uh, doing that same way so why don't we go ahead and do it now it's just you can just see it cleaner this way so we can go ahead and pinch that out i like the way that's looking um so having done all of that, let's go ahead and make this, I'm gonna make a copy and paste of it, turn off the old one, and now we can make this one editable. So we just got our final geometry. Let's go ahead and weld our caps on. I'm gonna say connect and delete. We could have hit checkbox before we made it editable. Um, if you go into the sweep, you can see under caps, you can say create single object, and then it wouldn't create separate caps when you make it editable. Uh, but here we go, we did make caps. Now we did, uh, actually, you know what I'm gonna do? Uh, I'm gonna hit undo. We've got all of our caps. Undo one more time. I'm going to say I want my caps to be uh, end guns. And now we'll make it editable. Actually, it's like single object, make editable. And you see that oh, it did triangulate. Didn't I just say end guns? I said end guns, but uh, it's still triangulating that one. It's, it's, I guess it's because we're creating a single object. That's interesting. Uh, anyway, um, I'm going to not make a single object. Let's make it editable. I just want to make this as clean as possible because we're going to do some... Um, soft body dynamics on it. So we can grab all of our caps. I'm going to hit select all. Let's hit, um, I actually think I might want to do bevel. Let's go ahead and give this a quick save. So this is uh, number four. And let's just say inflating tubes. Um, now, if I hit I for inner extrude, it's going to shrink them down, but I can overshoot my destination. But if we use a bevel, uh, MS, we can turn on limit. And now as I pull it, as I pull it, um, you see that the cap actually will terminate after a second. As, as soon as it kind of pinches down to nothing, it will terminate. Now, um, because I'm on polygon mode, it's also extruding it outward, which is fine. Actually, I kind of like it in this instance. Um, but keep in mind that there is an entire end gone up on the tip here. So what we are going to do is go to point mode, select all, right click, optimize. And actually there is a shortcut for optimize, which is UO. And you'll see that that will weld on. And now we can grab all of these and say connect and delete. And then I'm going to optimize again. So UO. And now everything should be welded together. And that does mean if we put in a subdivision surface, it should subdivide fairly well. So these could become nice and rounded. Uh, and we've got incredibly low poly overall shape here. So quite pleased with that. So... Now that we've got that going, let's see if we can get these to start inflating. Uh, we're going to be able to do some fun little things here. And we're going to whip through these really quickly. Um, do, 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 do. Um, so uh, let's go into our soft body. Well, let's right click and add a simulation, soft body. And let's go and turn off gravity. So Command D, Dynamics, General. Gravity equals zero. And now let's go ahead and hit frame forward. Boop. And I want to make sure that this is running pretty fast. Okay, you'll see that it is playing all right. It's not amazing playback. We're only getting two frames a second, but there is a lot of geometry here. Probably should have made less swirls on the tails because this inner part's really the only part that mattered for our purposes. But we're still getting some reasonable playback. All right. Now we'll slow down as things start colliding. But let's see what can happen if we maybe start increasing our rest length. Uh, or we could even increase pressure. Let's try starting with that. I'm gonna increase the pressure to 55. It's a little dangerous to do a bigger number right out of the gate, because you see it's gonna go boom and inflate uh, right away and then start uh, maybe exploding a bit. And actually there is no map on fall off. So maybe pressure is not the best one for our purposes here. Um, so I would, actually, I'm a little bit curious on the way this rest length is going to work. You know what I'm going to do? Uh, we want to do some tests, and we want them to run relatively quickly. So let's go ahead and just select one of these tails. I'm going to hit UP to split it out as its own. And let's temporarily yank this other one out. And we will come back to it, but I'm going to hide it for now and delete the tag. So now we just got one tail, and it should run at significantly faster time. So now we can do quicker tests. I'm less concerned with it uh, crashing on us. Um, so we can set a rest length, and we go up to 200. Uh, let's frame forward, and you're see it's going to go bloop, and it's going to inflate really big. And that, that was already kind of cool. That was really cool, actually. Let's play that again. Like, look at the way that's exploding outward. It's because some of the initial points are, oh, it's just getting forced out, and it couldn't float away quick enough. It's even, like, unraveling itself right away. Like, that's already 
super cool. Let's just throw that out there. In fact, I like that so much, I'm going to save this and then save a new version to continue so anybody on Patreon can go check that part out before we go and mess up that effect. Now, uh, one of the tests I want to do here was, can we use a vertex map to drive our fall off here so that it's not the scale, the rest length doesn't go? I never realized there was a vertex map on the rest length. So let's go ahead and create a vertex map on here. I'm going to select one point, and let's go ahead and say uh, selection, set vertex weight, uh, whatever, because that just makes a tag. Now we can turn on use fields in the fields. I don't care about the default. Let's just feed in a spherical field. And now you can see that it's got a fall off that we can control. So let's go ahead and increase the radius a bit. And now you can see that this middle part has got full effect and the outside's got very little effect. In fact, let's go and make sure that the remapping is all the way from the middle to the outside. And now... If we were to go, oh, and now we have to go into our soft body and drag in our vertex weight. So I want to see what effect this has. Interesting. Um, very interesting. It looks like if something has zero vertex weight, it actually shrinks it down to zero. It's putting its scale down to zero, but the inside is being fully applied. So first of all, it is working, which is awesome. And it's really interesting that this tail is shrinking down and it's shrinking down to almost infinitely tiny. But then once it gets inside this radius, it's like, oh, I'm supposed to have a little bit of radius. So I'll, I'll chill out. So actually, if we wanted this to inflate, we have to start thinking about fields in a more complex way. So right now, this vertex map is being driven, and right now it's being... Uh, can a, I don't know if a vertex tag can go above 100% to tell you the truth. We're about to find out. So I'm going to unclamp it, which shouldn't change anything. But now I'm going to create a solid, and I'm going to say I want the solid to add. So what's happening is imagine the solid is by itself full 100% everywhere. It's just a solid. It's a value of 100%. But now I'm adding it to whatever the sphere is doing, which means that should be 100%, but this inner part should be 200%. So this is actually working the way I hope it is. This inner part should inflate. Uh, and indeed it did. So vertex maps can go above 100%. This is very valuable information for us to keep in mind for the future. Um, so that, oh, that's awesome. Like that's, that is great. Uh, these are, this is good news. Um, now, what do we want to do? Well, uh, I think we want to, it's dangerous to have a rest length just pop into existence. So why don't we have it inflate into its final position? So at the time of zero, we want it to be 100%, so it's default. And then we'll let it play up to, let's say, frame 40. And by the time it gets there, we're going to inflate up to 300%. So there's a transition into it. So we hit play, and I can see it does a better job of kind of scaling up. And it does, like, that's awesome. Like, I'm, I'm very, very pleased with what the results we're getting out of here. Like, that is really cool automatically. Um, and, I mean, we've got all sorts of additional controls. I mean, we could be increasing the radius of the sphere, and as I do, the entire thing should inflate. If I pull it down, the entire thing should go back to its original shape. So, um, actually, it does seem like it got a little bit bigger. I mean, we're applying... Oh, that is interesting. Why is it doing any of that if it's at 100%? I'm not quite sure if we said zero. Whoa, be careful. Whoa. Okay, that's really cool. But uh, but yeah, it does seem to inflate already. So maybe my understanding here is a little off. Um, let's increase the radius there. If we didn't have this and we have the entire fall off, that tail does seem to shrink. So yeah, I'm not sure what I'm missing there. Boom. Uh, so I'm just going to ignore that for now. Uh, you know, this is supposed to be a quick one. We're going to rapid fire through it, but we're getting some really good info on this one. Um, but, uh, do you see, uh, some, if we're not worried about it colliding with itself right now, and I mean, it is colliding a little bit, but if we went into our dynamics tag and I turn off, uh, self collisions, this is going to run so fast. Like, look, we're getting, like, really great frame rate. Uh, and now it can intersect with itself. But if we don't worry about that, we're just kind of worried about viewing the scaling and all that, then we can worry about it colliding with itself later. So we've got this inflating. We've got it intersecting itself. Uh, and, yeah, it's just kind of doing a great job with it. Um, now, we could do some things uh, to control the dynamics a little bit more. Maybe we could add in some stiffness here. Not too much. We'll do a stiffness of one. And that should stop it from exploding all out. But now it's trying to keep its individual parts in its original position. Um, and it's causing it to like kind of flower out, which is cool. Um, and that could be really cool if we, um, 
that could be really cool if we wanted to uh, like kind of inflate some guts or do some sort of ribbon or something that's like piled up on itself. Just turn on self collisions and this would be keeping everything in approximately the same location. You see it actually starts forcing it the spiral helix around. Not a perfect helix. And I'm kind of happy it's not a perfect helix. But that is uh, right there. Dang cool effect. Um, but uh, we are increasing our rest length up to 300, which seems to be a little extreme. So let's go ahead and just select our one keyframe and change this one value to 200. And let's let it inflate a little bit. Okay, now it's a little more calm. So now it starts making me more confident and dragging in our original sweep. So I'm going to keep the quick one. Let's do that. I can actually st just steal the vertex tag and the dynamics tag over to it. We don't need the selection tags. Those actually just slow down cinema. Uh, having a selection tag is almost as bad as having an entire additional object. And you know, cinema doesn't like having a lot of objects. Um, but with our collisions turned off, no collisions, this should actually give us not amazing, but reasonable playback. And the vertex map is going to continue to work because it's based off of fields and not based off of existing points. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's doing a great job of inflating. Uh, I don't think stiffness was really the way to go because it's forcing some... Uh, some stiffness. Now, if we were trying to emulate a little bit of the original effect, uh, we'd need this to fall into a floor. So, uh, and gravity is easier than creating a sideways wind. So why don't we just go ahead and create a floor here. I'm going to grab our original geometry. We're at the time of zero, only make changes to dynamic objects at the time of zero. Uh, and I can pull this up into the air a little bit and it's going to need a little bit of space so it doesn't intersect. And let's go and turn on gravity, command D. Um, expert, let's get our, grr, not expert, general. We can right click on the on the gravity little tick marks and it's gonna jump it back to its default. Um, that's honestly a shortcut that I should have been using a long time ago and was not. Um, and let's see, stuff's going well, so let's go ahead and save this as another new version. So gravity's back on, they should fall to the ground. I'm going to great, uh, put dynamics on the floor and let's grab both the floor and our tubes and I want them to freely slide past each other so in our I'm going to get rid of all the bounce and all the friction it can just freely like it's slimy it can just slide past itself so let's go ahead and there's no still no self collision so hopefully we're still getting reasonable playback you're going to see it's going to inflate but it's going to fall down to the floor and now they're sliding along the floor and with the gravity hopefully this would stop them from uh, pushing past each other um, so now you can see that is doing a great job of kind of slithering around. It's actually a little bit creepy. Um, so with all that working, why don't we go ahead and quickly turn on a nice SSAO. Let's go ahead and drop on something with some color here. Uh, I guess it's kind of green and slimy, so let's go ahead and make it green. Make it a bluish green, yeah. Cool, so we do that, and now uh, I don't think we're going to get a good enough playback um, here, so I'm going to go ahead and tell it to, yes, indeed, do self-collisions, but then we'll go into our render settings. I'm going to tell it to do a hardware render. Don't worry about saving. Output all frames and give it a quick save, and now let's output that. I'm going to hide our spherical field because I just don't want to see that in the viewport. Hit play, or not play. Let's hit render, and... Um... There we go. <laughs> Sorry, I zoomed up on the banana from the previous one. Um, so, as you can, see, you can see, even now, it's taking a while to do the calculation, which is why we're rendering here and not to the viewport, because it would be really hard to get feedback in the viewport if we were doing this. But now, each of these individual tubes is, infl is successfully inflating and pushing back all of the other ones. Now, we will see here that with them all inflating, they're losing space. And it looks like this top one is escaping by pushing up out the top. So what we could do is hit Command D and increase our gravity and tell gravity to say, nope, you got to stay. You can't go up so much. You got to stay down. Gravity should hopefully become a more overwhelming force. Uh, we could actually, you know what, I'm going to go up to 3,000. So gravity is three times as strong as it used to be. Uh, and that's looking pretty good. But And let's hit play before we do more changes. But hit play and like that's doing a pretty good job of growing up there. Um, and honestly, it would probably be, what's a good way to do this? It would probably be more impressive if they were a little bit skinnier to start out. So I'm going to select all of them and hit, um, how do we shrink them? If I hit D for extrude, uh, it should shrink them, but I don't want the, it's going to invert the other tails. It's going to invert the bottom tails. Um, 
let's see, MG, can I just iron them? Ooh, okay, iron is doing a pretty good job there. By just saying uh, MG, the iron tool, and ironing down, it changed the geometry on the tip a little bit here. I'm not too worried about that, but it did make them all a little bit more skinny. I think it's just gonna look cooler if they're a little bit skinnier to start out with. Um, so having done that, let's uh, go ahead and do another quick hard ren hardware render. Um, so immediately you can see them start scaling up. They're also falling to the ground. We want to give a few frames for them to successfully fall to the ground first. Um, and then even here, you can see the gravity now is starting to force these to be a little bit flatter. Um, so we could add some extra flexion and uh, and shear forces so those can't bend in quite so much. Um, so far, uh, because we made them thinner and because um, the gravity is stronger, you see they're not popping up out, but they are very clearly sliding around and past each other. So that is pretty cool. Um, let's just hit play. Yeah, I feel like, uh, so a couple quick changes we'll make again. Um, let's not have these start inflating right away. So we're gonna give this 10 frames to settle on the ground before it starts going, and then we'll give it an extra 10 frames to go. Um, that starts inflating. Uh, I think I do want it to inflate bigger. So go we'll grab the dynamics tag again, grab its one keyframe. I will say go up to 300 start filling up the space more. Um, I am going to add a little bit of friction in, not too much. Let's give it a friction of 20-20. Mm, so they're each 20. Uh, this will just stop them from sliding too far along the ground, but shouldn't stop them too much. And then inside the dynamics tag, let's go ahead and give ourselves some extra shear forces. So let's jump this up to, I don't know, 200 and flexion of 200. This is just stopping it from any individual polygon from bending too much. Um, and structural is fine. We want that. We don't want that to be crazy because they do have to stretch. Uh, okay, so that's a bunch of little changes. Let's see what that gives us. So we got our first ten frames for it to just. Oh dear. Uh, okay. Well. Okay. I just learned something. It is immediately inflating to some degree. So the way we are currently feeding in the field, yes, it gets stronger and stronger uh, as the inflation goes. But the field is already, oh, that makes sense, actually. That makes sense. I get it. Um, we are ramping up our rest length, and that becomes a multiplier. But we are in our field, inside the fields here, we are adding a solid, which means in the middle point, it's already at like 200%, 100 from the spherical field and 100 from the solid so it's inflating it extra big in the beginning so in order for this to properly work the way i'm kind of treating it we'd actually want the either strength or the spherical field to be keyframed up so we could go into its uh, strength here and keyframe that up over the initial time as well so at the frame of 10 the strength is actually at zero and then as we get up to 50 that would actually now have gone up to 100. um but let's check out what, you know, regardless of that, let's see if there's any good feedback we can see. Uh, the friction is doing a good job of stopping everything from shooting all over the place. It does suddenly inflate once we get to frame 10. It's settled on the ground. The, uh, the increased flexion and shear, you can see it's not collapsing in on itself as much, so that's good. Um, uh, I mean, the way it's exploding and flowering out and all that stuff, it's pretty cool. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with it. Um, it, it is going a little bit, I mean, it is going a little bit crazy. I mean, at a certain point, you can't stop it. Um, we could keep on counter fighting it with more gravity, stop those from inflating too quick. It could just be going so big and so quick that it doesn't have enough time to slow down or to unfold itself. The friction could be fighting it. We do have the option, it would be kind of a guess, but we could take this floor, copy and paste the floor, move the floor up into the air. I have to go high enough that it's not gonna really catch the inflation, but it's gonna stop from popping up too high. But make sure you do flip it upside down because the the uh, normals of that do matter. Let's make that floor, it's there, but it's invisible. So now, I mean, we have, we'd have to be careful, but something that would be kind of cool is if we do move this, actually, let's do it. I'm gonna move it down pretty dang close to the snakes, actually. So now as they try and inflate, it's gonna squish up against like a pane of glass effectively and uh, stop it from going too far. So I think that might be a kind of an interesting effect. It's not specifically what we we're going for, but that might be neat. So uh, let's let this one run for a few. Um, so you can see now our assumption was correct. The added strength on both of them was forcing it to 
start inflating right away, but now it's not inflating right away. So now it gets 10 frames to settle on the ground, which seems like about the right amount of time. And then right about now, the inflation is going to start ramping up. So now you can see it slowly start inflating. It's not only increasing our rest length from 100 to 300, the uh, extra bonus size is also increasing. Um, so yeah, everything, the structure is forcing these to spiral around instead of just like inflate outward. It is inflating upward. We haven't hit the second pane of glass yet, but I think we will soon. Um, it's doing a good job so far. Everything's starting to push up against each other. Nice. There we go. And now this shouldn't be able to go up much higher than that as it's inflating. And then given enough frames, this might fly out and settle down eventually. Now you can see some flatness happening at the top, so I think we're hitting that upper pane of glass. Pretty weird and interesting. Like, I like it. It's pretty fun. Um, uh, we'd have to just give that some more frames to settle itself down because it will keep on inflating until frame frame 50, so it's actually not even done doing that. Uh, and, of course, the final thing um, I would want to do is just turn on the subdivision surface to make sure that that is looking good. Um, yeah, it's doing a pretty good job. And you can see the, they're not flying up in the air like they were before. They can still probably pass over each other. There's nothing stopping them from, from doing that technically. But once again, we could do some... Uh, we could do various things. Actually, a funny idea that popped in my head to stop that would be um, if we, like, f draped a blanket over it, essentially, like a, a plane with more soft bodies, and it would be constantly pushing down some weight on everything, stopping them from wanting to pop, pop up into the air. So it must be like putting this floor, but it would just be a blanket resting on top of it. It's really interesting how we're getting how these are shooting out on the outside, um, forming these flower shapes. I kind of wouldn't expect that as much because we weren't using um, any shape, any stiffness. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what that is. I think it's just growing big enough, fast enough on the outside that it doesn't know where to go. Uh, we are hitting our final growth point here. So let's see, right now should be our final frame of continued growth. So you see they're done growing now. So every frame after this is just it's settling down and sliding along the ground based on the frictions that are being applied on the overall shape. Soft bodies does such a great job. Like, look how gorgeous this overall setup is. Like, that is so nice looking, the way it, uh, it's not passing through itself. It's popping on top of itself. Like, it's just really cool looking ribbons. Um, I just love the way that that looks. Like, the pattern, these patterns emerging. It's almost like, uh, this is like the dynamics version of, you know, when people... People put sand on a speaker and it starts forming the different, uh, what do you call it, the like interference patterns. Um, it's kind of like the noise version of that. Like at a certain point, these have scaled so much that they've got nowhere to go. So they have to start forming these patterns. Um, it just it just goes to show you can have emergent properties out of nature effectively um, that almost form like self-organization. Um, so that's pretty cool. And we can see it... Uh, we can see it just settling down here. It's going to keep on probably pushing out and spiraling. Less friction might help. Um, so that's all looking good. Uh, I'm not going to make any changes to any of that. Let's just... Um, I'm just going to turn on subdivision surface and make sure that that indeed does run. And I should probably uh, not... Yeah, I'm going to hit NA so we just get the clean polygons here. And we let that run. And then we'd just be getting the uh, smooth out version. I just want to make sure the dynamics are actually running on it. Because sometimes, I don't know if it's a bug, but a limitation can be where when you run a dynamic simulation, when you throw it to certain children, it won't acknowledge it unless you bake it. And I mean, it's not like it's difficult to bake, but it's just a, an, ex an extra step and something you have to wait for. Um, so let's see. Yeah, it does seem to fall to the ground. Yeah, and then right now it should start growing. And I mean, everything's just going to look better with it being subdivided more here. So we're not going to wait. I'll let this keep on chugging in the background while we go and track down the next question. But that was a that was a fun one. Um, so let's jump back into the chat, everybody. We're doing good here. We're cranking through them. Uh, let's see. Some people are chatting back and forth here. Uh, hopefully the chat is still continuing. Actually, give me a split second. I'm going to click on here, and I want to see if... Um, my chat is continuing through uh, because yeah it seems like my my 
hybrid chat thing, which has given me all the chats from both uh, YouTube and from Twitch and from Facebook. It is no longer updating, but I did have Twitch also open, so I can see that. Uh, let's check out some of the chat here. Thank you, everybody. Um, let's see, lots of good conversation going on in there. Not some of it's not specifically questions for me. Uh, Leo just has a typed question. How would you tackle the center middle points in a mirrored pose morph that are meant to be 100% together later during the animation? Since the pose morphs are additives and everything else in the mirror would be doubled. That is way... Uh, sorry, sorry, uh, Leo, but I am not following that question um, super specifically. Um, but I appreciate it. Um, Paul has a link to Vimeo. Uh, I am not sure 100% that the question is for me, but let's find out. Oh, no, that's a link to uh, the Chain Project. Um, so I think that's just uh, inter interperson chat in there. Um, Fried, what do you got? You got a link to Instagram here. Let's see what we've got here. I'm going to come on, window. Come over here. Okay, so this is a motion mate. Uh, and let's hit play. Let's see what we got. Whoa. Do, 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 do. Oh, neat. Uh, okay, so what do we got? Well, first of all, this motion mate. Um, 3D time created by uh, Andre Jazunka. It could just be Zunka, or it could be Andre J. Zunka. Um, but what, uh, what it seems like we have here is um, a bunch of really fun hair things. I, I totally think we could do some of this. Um, let's try and think of, I mean, it's very spherical, but the spherical nature is needed. Um, and it's, oh, it's almost like inverting a very basic concept in a really clever way. Uh, let's see how our render is doing here on the previous one. Blurp. Yeah, pretty neat ribbony stuff, just letting it inflate and not push through each other. Heavy gravity. Uh, I think that growing a little slower, maybe a little less friction. Obviously, get some sexy lighting and stuff in there. It could be really cool. Um, but uh, we will wrap that one up right there. Maybe I'll tinker with that some more later by myself. But anyway, getting to this hair thing. Um, the Let me make sure that I have the correct. Okay, do I have the correct screen up? Cool. So... So, 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 here is my thought. I'm trying to think of how to do it differently because I don't want to just make a sphere on a sphere and have it circle around. Um, but because it's having the pull inward, um, I'm trying to think of a way around that. You know what? I got a, I got a way. We're going to make a torus shape and we're going to make it a little skinnier. And actually, uh, probably we're going to make it a bigger ring. We're going to make it skinnier. Uh, I'm going to make a duplicate of it, and we're going to make this one editable. And we're going to do a loop selection, UL. We're going to loop there. I'm going to do UL and loop there. And hit UF, hold down Shift, grab that, delete. So you see I've just got these inner polygons like that, exactly what I want. Those will be a surface for us to grow from. And then, um, how do I make this not exactly what they were doing? I mean, I kind of got this little plant thing going. Um, I guess we can make it, yeah, we, it doesn't have to be a circle per se, so we can make more of a spiral, I'm thinking. Um, what's kind of a weird shape we can make? Uh, let's make a, a little bit of a disc shape here, and we're going to put this into a cloner, and we're going to make it, uh, radial. Let's make it flat on the ground, pull out. The count five is fine. Transform. Let's stretch it out. There we go. Pinch those in like that. I like that. We can change our radius like that. T for scale. We'll scale that out. Actually, yeah, actually, we want that not to be all the way. Um, okay, that's good. And then I kind of like to swirl those around. Um, so something that's cool. Let's see. What's a good way to do that? The twist doesn't behave that way. So is this the... Let me think. Let me think. 
how do you twist? Twirl something. Plane effect, or how do I do that? I've done it before, I just need to think of it. Now if we did a twist, that doesn't, a twist needs verticality to do some twisting. So if we wanted to spin the entire thing, why am I utterly blanking on this? I mean, I could put a bend in that, but that's not what I want to do. I mean, I feel like that is it just a displacer, but then it's not going to spin. I guess that doesn't. Yeah. Oh, okay. That doesn't do it that way. So yeah, actually, I'm in my head. I'm not thinking of anything specific here. Um, well, that's fine. I'm just going to put this as a child, and then if we were to bend uh, ninety degrees. Spin it. Oh, right now, I'm just kind of guessing until we get the proper curvature. So it's not that one. It's not that one. So it must be this one. There we go. We'll sort of. We'll go negative 90. Oops. I don't know. I just did. Undo negative 90. And then we change the bend. Very strange. Um, fit the parent. S angle. 180 bend. Cool. That's what I wanted. Now, well, that's just strange. Uh, I guess we would do it after the fact. It's because they're not scaled until after the fact, so they're getting, they're really fat, but they're getting scaled down. So you get those weird shapes. You know what? I don't care about the twirl anymore. But the twirl, I, I am a little bit, uh, is a little, the, the twirl is throwing me off there. <sighs> okay, 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 okay. Let's not get uh let's not get too bogged down here because we're getting bogged down. Okay, stop. And then we put that into a connect, and we've got this geometry. So here's the here's the actual cool trick here is we want this to be spinning. In fact, why don't we do some of the cool new um, um we're gonna do cool new stuff with fields here. So I'm actually gonna make a clone, and I'm gonna make a clone of one. And we'll see if this actually works, because what I want to do is put hair on here. So we're going to put a simulation uh, hair object at hair. So this is supposed to be on the connect and growing hair, but it is not. So um, that doesn't work. So let's try doing it instead on this cloner. We'll go simulate add hair. It does not add hair. So that means this needs to be made editable. Turn off the cloner, simulate add hair and it does add it. Now can we still control it with the cloner? And if I were to tell the cloner to, oh, I don't know, let's just say, uh, transform and rotate a little bit, would those follow? They do not. Um, does the, if I put the hair in with it, does it file, follow, spin? Um, maybe? It's hard to tell, so now we have to keyframe that. So, keyframe, fast forward to the end, fast forward, run, play. Uh, okay, it's that's not counting, unfortunately. So, uh, we can't we can't use the cloner trick there. I was just hoping we could use time to, as a big offset. Doesn't doesn't like it. Um, all right, so we've got these hairs growing. Um, the uh, length is just kind of set. Um, you can change, what's the way you change the, and we can change length inside of um, the fall off there, but that's always a big pain in the butt. Um, so on one degree, yeah, I guess to get to the essence of some of the things we want to do here, a lot of this we shouldn't worry about too much. Uh, how many hairs do I want? I'm going to say 1,000. Uh, and then in the editor, I'm going to say I want to see not the hair guides, but I want to see the actual hairs. I want to see 100% of them. So now if I click off this, we're actually seeing final hairs. So um, what we're going to do is, um, I'm, as much as I'm trying not to use plugins, it would take too long to get a, a looping animation like I want here without using signal. So I'm going to right click and add a grayscale gorilla signal tag. Um, so I designed this plugin. It's one of my favorites. Uh, I'm going to drive the H parameter. And all I'm going to do is drag this down. And the reason for doing this is if I 
drag my curvature like this and I say I want to rotate 45 degrees, I can say that I want it to be an additive loop. And now every time, let's say that 25 frames goes by, it's going to suddenly spin and then stop, spin and stop, spin and stop. So we need more time. So I'm going to say 50 frames. And let's go ahead and jump this up to 100. So it's going to spin and stop for a while, spin and stop for a while. So we got that all going for us. Working great. Um, hair, dynamics, inside the dynamics, we've got mm, no forces. Each hair has its own built-in gravity. I'm going to give it a positive gravity. So it's constantly trying to pull the hair up. You can see how it's trying to recenter the hair vertically. Uh, dynamics, um, properties. Let's see, what do we got? Uh, rest mix, nope, nope, drag. Okay, here's some drag. Drag would probably be really good. Let's add in 75% drag. Oh, look at that. Every time it moves, it is snap. Oh, it's very, it's being left behind and then trying to approach it. Let's see if we can increase stiffness beyond 100. Unfortunately, we can't. Um, so what we can do is in the advanced tab in dynamics, I'm going to give it less segments so it's going to treat it a little bit uh stiffer so i'm going to drop this down and as we do this each time i drop it down further it's going to be kind of stiffer than the time before so what's the minimum we can get away with so mm, i like the way five looks i'd really like those to snap in quicker so what we're going to do is go back to our forces and we're going to make gravity way stronger I'm going to go 10 times as strong so you can see it's going to be left behind and then snap back Left behind snap. I really like that motion. So that's really cool. And the way uh, we're driving that, of course, is with signals. So we could change this curvature. Um, like we're, we're easing in and easing out, but we could, of course, snap that. So it could be like go whoop. So, you know, we got a lot of options there. But, I mean, ease in and ease out is a good uh, natural thing to go for. All right. So that's cool. Uh, and then at the same time, we've got the exact same concept that we're going to do on the outer torus that we made. So we can go ahead to our select the torus, go to hair, add hair, and now we're growing hair from there as well. Now, here's where things get interesting, is I'm going to tell this forces I want no gravity, and then you, they're going to kind of just aim outward. Let's do the exact same thing. So I'm going to say I only want 1,000 hairs. Um, I want to see the actual hairs. I want to see... All airs, I can deselect it now. I'm going to move this down to the torus, and let's actually steal the uh, rotation, except I'm going to say instead of going 45, I'm going to go negative 45. So it's doing equal but opposite. And uh, But that doesn't have the gravity. Uh, a couple things we need to do with it, actually. Why don't we go ahead into our dynamics, and we'll go add in that 90% drag, which is doing an awesome job. I really like the way that's being left behind. Um, and then we need to add a particle force. So let's go and add a simulation particle attractor. And the important thing here is in the hair, I'm going to tell it in the forces to, right now it's including everything. So I'm gonna make sure that our other, this middle hair, I don't want it to see the attractor, but these outside hairs should be. So now what do we do? Well, let's go ahead and set a speed limit of about 2,000, something reasonable. And now let's start increasing our strength. Not enough. Let's do ten or 1,000. I'm not sure. Okay, there we go. So now I'm at 10,000, and now you can see it's actually starting to actually react a little bit. So let's go and go even higher, and let's see what we get. So now it's going to turn, and it's so it's just, the attraction is so high that it's really forcing it to the middle. I'm going to see if we can lower our speed limit and if that will do anything. Um... It's doing a little too much there. Uh, speed limit is just like how quick could a particle move via the parameters we're feeding it. Um, so uh, I just want to make sure it wasn't too much. So now I think we just need to control. Let's not worry about the speed limit. It's high enough where it shouldn't be doing anything. And now, yeah, okay, that's almost perfect already. Uh, it's pretty much getting to its final position right as it's about to start doing its next bit of movement. Um, so yeah, that's actually working pretty great. So you can see the overall effect that we're getting is we get this final shape and you get that sudden put, pull away, but then it goes back to the middle and these outer ones are being left behind. So you take that and you get just get some nice uh, nice hairs applied here. So let's go ahead and make this kind of... Well, what I had been thinking was that um, we should make it kind of like a plant of some sort. So this is the outer ones. So we're not going to go too far, but if we were to just make it... Let's make it a nice deep green here and maybe go to a lighter green. And let's 
kind of kill the specular. We're going to make these really thick. So let's go mm, 22 to 22. I, I usually make our root and the tip the same and completely control it via this spline. So we can just make it go thinner like that. And let's give this a quick save. We haven't saved it at all, which is dangerous. Number five. Um, what do we call it? Uh, dragging, dragging hair. Gravities. Uh, quick render here. Okay, way too fat. So let's go 11, 11, 11, 11. Uh, better. Let's uh, give it... Actually, something that's kind of fun here is like, let's make that thicker, thinner. So it's kind of like a little bulge out on the tip there. Uh, and let's go 6 and 6. So there we go. Uh, a little bit more interesting. Maybe even pull that back a bit still. Yeah, it's not bad. And then uh, something I typically would do is go to scale, and then we can give this, it's already got a variation of 20%. So some are longer, some are thinner. Stylistically, it depends on what you want to do. Inside of color, I could add in a 5% hue variation. Now you can see we get different colors. We can add uh, saturation. In, I mean, it does something, but it's not much. 5% saturation. Value is a very heavy-handed parameter. you got to go easy. If you go too far, you'll dramatically, you see they start getting black even at 15%. So you got to go really easy on uh how bright that is but yeah a little bit of variation there um maybe cut the saturation on that just back a little bit there we go um so um yeah the torus is spinning uh i probably don't want that one to render but i do want that to render because i just want this final one to go um and then uh why don't we make a duplicate of that plant i mean this is an old school technique i've talked about this many times but on this middle one why don't we make these kind of like some sort of flowers it's really straightforward let's go ahead and um uh, i'm going to invert this gradient and then we're going to make a nice let's make an orange bright orange flower on the tip and that's going to do that and right around the way this gradient is behaving we can go to our thickness and let's go ahead and really Thicken that sucker up there. It will go easier on the stem. Pull back on that base part. Let's thicken them up to 11, 11. And let's see what we get there. So now you can see we have this like big fat flower on the end. Um, I mean, what's great, I mean, it's fun. I mean, it's not like it's super detailed, but it, like, it looks neat. Um, it gives it a little bit of depth. And we've got that color variation in there. Probably chill that out a little bit. Saturation, chill out. Huge chill out. There we go. That blends in a little bit better. Uh, I'm going to pull that out, and let's make that a little less saturated, a little darker, just to distinguish between that and that. So now we've got these flowers, and then um, got the grass on the outside. So that is working well. Uh, I think the scale, I'll go even further on the variation, so we'll do 45 on the overall length of those. Uh, you also have the option, or the scale, because then you also have the alternative option of the length, so that will make uh, some of them shorter as well um, but I think scale is the way to go so I'm not gonna worry about length um, any other I mean we could add some some frizz if we wanted to so those will spread out um, because of the nature of us wanting to see these in a more uniform way I would go pretty light on it because they're still gonna face uh, forward um, and then uh, I don't have any kind of a dirt material or anything um, that I would put on the uh, on the outside uh, I mean, I would. It would be nice to throw on some sort of dirt. I just don't have anything handy, um, so we'll just make it a really dark color with a very um, shallow specular. So nothing fancy there. We'll apply it to these uh, petals as well, just so they kind of fade into the background. And um, and yeah, I think that's the overall effect. And then you just kind of view this from the front here, or I guess at the top. Uh, we'll render out a couple of frames. Honestly, it loops pretty quick. Let's see how quick it does loop, because we are seeing the final result here, so we should be able to... Because we're getting back to the same position, I guess we'd have to do one full rotation, so we're going 45 degrees. Um, let's see, so it's three, 360 divided by 45, 8. So now we go, it's 8. So it's 8 times 45, which is just 360? That doesn't make sense, does it? From 0 to... 45 times has to happen eight times, and that's just, oh, 315, interesting. So 315 is actually the number of frames we want, minus one to get a perfect loop. Um, if that actually, if they actually are getting to their final position again, which they kind of seem to, so that might actually kind of be a, a perfect loop. Um, 
I'm going to cut our resolution in half just so we can see if this will actually finish. Render. I mean, it does render really quick. Now, if, actually, that's a good point. If we're viewing this perfectly from the top, these top ones are not going to show up very clearly. Um, and they are getting illuminated. Uh, something that is neat is I'm going to grab both of them. If we go into the illumination tab, we could uh, play around with these where we don't worry about a lot of these settings like um, shadow density, receiving shadow, self shadow, back shadow. Don't care about any of those. And then um, diffuse. Yeah, okay, by getting rid of diffuse, you see that they're 100% colored in all the time. So now, um, yeah, so these top ones might end up being a little bit flat if we don't have a little bit of an angle. The frizz we added in should help, but um, honestly, it's something I'm kind of thinking is it might be cool not to see this geometry at all. So all we're seeing is the, uh, the actual, you know, plant matter here. So having done that, let's go ahead and put them in a nice blue sky. Make a sky object, put that in. Uh, of course, it's going to be a big gradient traveling around. And keep in mind that the very bottom of a giant sphere, which we're looking down on, is what will ultimately be receiving the color. So that's actually black here. If we invert it, then it's white. If we change this to blue, not a perfect blue, something like that. And then we'll fade it up to a lighter color. That can go pretty light. Uh, yeah, then we're going to see that gradient there. That's fine. We got a little turbulence if we wanted to break up that pattern just a little bit. Um, actually, you got to be careful because now you can see the black is sneaking through the turbulence. Um, but because we're never getting to this black color, I could just make a duplicate of this blue, drag it to the end, and it should stop that from happening. And now it's just not quite a perfect gradient. Uh, render. Those, oh, those are popping up, popping out pretty nicely. Um, yeah, nothing, nothing too crazy here. Why don't we make it this uh, actually square? So I'll go 640, 640, boom, boom. Zoom up on that a little more. I'm even fine with a little bit of an angle here. Uh, and also keep in mind, in the reference piece, they were using a refractive sphere. So all these hairs were inside of a refractive sphere, and that's what we were seeing. We're not going to do that. Um, that also kill our render times for a live stream. Um, so let's go ahead and see what we get. We didn't really spend any time on lighting or anything here, but let's just see if we get anything kind of visually interesting. Um, so those are taking, these outer ones are taking longer to settle. The, these top ones we told to settle really quick because the gravity is pulling them up so strongly. But then it kind of gives us this extra follow through on the top. So I don't know, that's kind of fun. Now, if every, if every like pie slice here was identical, we could get away with only rendering 45 frames but these were randomly generated, so they're not identical. So if we don't render a full 360 degree rotation, then you won't get a perfect loop. Uh, but yeah, if this was built a little smarter, if we had a clone directly onto, um, wait, why did it suddenly, look at this. Why did it suddenly go really stiff? It's no longer, uh, it's no longer uh, dragging behind. Do, do hair dynamics stop calculating after a certain length? Nice. Nice, 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 and then nope, nope. Like, why does that? Why did that happen? I've never seen that before. Um, but but what's cool is you did see how freaking fast that rendered. Uh, okay, let's check our hair, gravity. That's cool. Dynamics, um, advanced. Nope, that's fine. Modifier is nothing. Animation, relax. No auto time. I mean, it says auto time zero to ninety. Um, this clearly was working beyond 90. It's still working over 180. Um, enable collisions, rigid forces, hair to hair. Uh, I don't know. Okay. If anybody in the chat has any idea why that might've happened, please let me know. Cause I don't even know where to look. We can go to our render settings to our hair renderer objects. No, nope, that's all fine. Length 20, that's all fine. Multipass, that's a non-variable. Sampling. Um, the attractor shouldn't change anything that's constantly going all the time. I mean, I was wondering if there's some sort of... Uh, like, you know, in... Uh, like, there's reconstitution after resting contact in things like dynamics, which is, um, can it die and then come back again? And, it, you know, we're saying, like, yes, it can. But I didn't think that was a variable in hair. Like, if hair stopped moving, 
I wouldn't think that they would stop moving. Um, oh, uh, oh, somebody's saying, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, okay, well, Level Bevel is saying it might stop because Signal stops. Signal will never stop. You can see it's still spinning. You see these are still turning, so Signal's running. But this stopped running. This was still dynamic up until around this time, around, around 200. And right now our project time is going to 200. So our frames are past, we're actually rendering out beyond where our project time is. So if we were to tell this to go all the way to 400, then we could, that's probably saying, hey, calculate past 400. So now that we've done that, Let's go ahead and render. That is a very, very good guess. Did that just start out in a weird first frame? Okay, well, look, here's another variable. You can see, oh wait, at the time of, uh, they don't have time to settle. And actually that's an important thing as well. These need some time to get to their zero position um, like that. So we actually need 45 frames before the animation starts for that to work. So we might need to pre-roll this negative 45 um, so that those have some time to go. Signal should automatically go negative as well. That's the advantage of saying additive on signal. So, okay, and that did indeed seem to work because you see at the beginning when I just did this, all I did was change our start time, but now it pre-rolled the calculations for hair and you see they're already all pointing in the middle where in our previous run at the very beginning, they were all angled at their funky angles because they hadn't settled in yet. So that was a really easy to fix, but it did work. Um, so let's see what we get. So nice twirl. So uh, we're cranking through. We'll let this finish. Um, and then uh, uh, let's see. Is it going to go beyond 200? I bet you are right. That's a really good guess. And there is a, there is a kind of a weird logic to it. Um, yep, yep, it's still working. So great, great catch there on uh, for Paul. Um that's just a bizarre one. I mean, yeah, it's, it's weird, but it's just good to know that there was a fix. Um, it's a weird little sharp uh, gradient there. I guess maybe the turbulence is causing that. And then uh, it looks like I did the bad calculation on our final frame here because we're cutting off right in the middle. So maybe I needed some extra frames there at the end. Uh, I'm not going to worry about making a perfect loop now because you can see the concept. And as long as it settles down, then I think we would pretty much get a perfect loop. Um but I think that this is pretty much what we are seeing in the other one. Um, it is really neat to be able to get to uh, get to these loops. And honestly, like I said, it's not going to be a perfect loop because these are not all perfectly lined up. If we just go to around there, right before it starts moving again. So if we just go to about frame 50, uh, let's we'll just have this play back to frame 50. It's not going to be a perfect loop because you're going to see a little pop. Oh, wait, these are, oh, uh, burp, burp, burp. okay, here's another variable. Um, this has got five sides, so I'd have to do an increment of five, not 45. So I shouldn't have been spinning, spinning 45 degrees in the beginning. I should have uh, done like 360 divided by five in order to get units like this. So yeah, just another calculation I didn't think about. Uh, it's so unusual for me to work in a unit of five. I didn't even think about it. Um, so that, that explains why we're not getting a perfect loop. Um, but yeah, okay, that will wrap this one up. I think there was some definitely some cool stuff there, things I hadn't thought about, like using a tractor to pull hair in to kind of be resetting it and making, you know, it's just kind of neat, like putting a heavy drag behind it. Like we don't have a lot of settings when it comes to hair behaving dynamically, so it's cool that we did have at least that much. So let's give that a save, and I'm going to jump back into the chat and take a look at some of these comments. And yeah, it does seem like my uh, comments on this one thing died, which is a little frustrating. I'm gonna restart that app. Um, but I can still see the comments in Twitch. So uh, feel free to put your questions again down here and, uh, and I will see them again. Uh, Java, a written question I'm having Hang on, let me do, 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 click here, and then click here. And Java is saying, I'm having trouble sticking a dynamic object to another. I'm trying to stick a, a badge on a cloth. So that you've tried using springs, connectors, constraints. Um, did not do a good job as you're expecting. If there's a way, if there's a way to really fix the points of an object to another. Um, so, uh, fine question. Let's see if we can get something reasonable working. 
Boom, boom, boom. Back to the chat. Okay, so um, the quickest way to do this is just set up some very, very simple, quick dynamics. Um, so let's set something up like this. Um, actually, just for our purposes, I mean, did you say cloth or soft body? A badge on a cloth. Um, but you're saying you're using springs and connectors and constraints, so that makes me think you are talking about soft body. Um, so look, we are going to literally make the simplest setup we can. We're going to make a collider cube here. Let's go ahead and make a color in there. Let's go ahead and make a nice orange. Throw that on there and make a sky because why not? Okay, so now we've got, and let's turn on polygons here. We're going to go ahead and make this a soft body on the cloth simulation soft body uh, sphere. We're going to add a simulation collider body. We're going to add heavy, heavy friction, no bounce, heavy friction so they don't slide off. I hit play, and now we've got some cloth. Now, if you wanted some nice floppy cloth on here, let's go ahead to our soft body. And I'm going to say that you are indeed allowed to have some shear. So let's say low shear and low flexion, which pretty much means it's very, very bendy. Not completely bendy. We can set it to 1 1. So now it should be very floppy. You can see it kind of stretch and go straight. Um, and then we can actually increase our structural to like 300, and that should stop it from stretching too much. So that you can see that our squares are being maintained, but they're allowed to be pinched. So that just gives you kind of some floppy cloth on there. And if we drop these to 1, 1, then these should be very, you can, by changing the damping, you can dramatically change the, um, the, the, the overshoot and the overlap and whatnot. So yeah, damp damping is an incredibly powerful setting when it comes to this kind of stuff. I wonder what a good setting is. Let's say 5.5. Five. I don't want to go forever. Yeah, there we go. That's, that's not bad. Okay, so now let's just say we want to stick something on here. So first of all, let's give this a save in the beginning. Just a smart idea. Um, let's see. Uh, locking onto cloth. Or soft body. Let's be descriptive. All right. So, uh, okay. So, um, so dynamics are running, and that's all working well enough. Let's go ahead and make a tiny sphere here, so we can clearly see it. And I'm going to make a. Let's go ahead and make it illuminant red, no color, red. Okay. So now we can very clearly see that as well. So uh, I am thinking our first step here would be, let's say, well, where do we want it to stick? Let me just look at a piece of cloth that looks, uh, okay. All right. Let's just do it right here. Let's say we want it to be kind of sticking right on that point. Um, we will, uh, we are going to start with a constraint tag. So if we go and we add um, a constraint tag, character constraint, then I'm going to say that I want it to be clamped I'm going to go to the clamp tab, and what it's clamped onto, it's clamped onto the plane. And I'm going to say it's clamped onto the surface. And I do want to use the normal. And now I'm going to move it to wherever I want it to be. If I want to be real specific, I hit Shift-C, and I can snap it to that point right there, and it's just exactly there. Turn off snapping, Shift-C Shift-S, not Shift-C, Shift-S. Um, and now it is there, it's on the surface, it's aligned on Y as a constraint, why not? or as a fong normal, and I can say lock the position. Um, oops, I should not have locked the position. Let's do that again. Shift S, snap, whoa there. Okay, see this, this that's what threw us off is I forgot to put the distance down to zero. So now I can snap, are you not snapping? Snap, okay, it's behaving a little strangely here. Um, use normals, fix position. Uh, Okay, it is snapping, but a little bit oddly. But okay, let's just pretend that didn't happen. Distance is still zero. Now I should be able to lock it. And now you see it didn't jump because I, I should have put distance down to zero in the beginning. So just by doing that, with any luck, let's hit save. Uh, with any luck, that should be stuck there. You see that is indeed stuck to the side. But you're probably also going to notice that there's probably like a frame of lag. So let's view it perfectly from the side and hit one frame forward. Do you see how that looks like the plane moved and then that didn't? So you see it's like falling behind. So a couple things here. First of all, if we bake our dynamics, let's just go ahead and bake this object. It should be really quick. And we hit one frame forward. You see, actually, it is still happening. Now, it's nice to have it baked. Um, it is baked, right? I said bake, but it doesn't look like a baked icon. Let's just make sure. I am curious. Oh, I baked the sphere, not the plane. Derp. 
okay, bake, <laughs> bake the actual soft body. Sorry about that. Okay, so now if I frame forward, now that I baked it, look, it is actually keeping up with it. It's not falling a frame behind. So just by baking it, that has made it so this is no longer being calculated at the time of dynamics. It's being calculated at the time of um, animation, I think. So I also want to set this as a fong normal. I think that will keep it pointing straight. Yeah, you can see it's actually stuck on the surface now. So that should be stuck that way. Now, having said that, if you did want to keep this a live dynamic object, let's clear out our bake. And if we were to go to our constraint, I'm going to move the sphere down here and let's just call it uh, red. Um, I'm going to grab this constraint and the constraint is calculating at the time of expression. Expression calculates before dynamics. So what I usually do is jump over to generators and I crank this all the way up. It's a little bit dangerous. There's reasons not to do this. But by putting it on the generator layer after everything, even though we're not baked, if I hit frame forward, you see it is actually moving with the dynamics because it's being calculated after the dynamics. So you'll see that actually will be stuck. Now I have, I mean, this is working fine. Having said that, I have had problems in the past where a an object will like reset for some reason. It's like if, a partic if, I, if I'm over here and I grab my plane and I move it and then change the dynamics while the dynamics aren't at zero, it might pop somewhere else and jump. So there's a problem that you could still run into there. But uh, I think that this is a fine start. Now, this is fine for essentially attaching a single point, a single, you know, it's attaching to a single point, but let's try pushing this concept a little bit further. Um, I'm going to, let's go ahead and we've got our red, but let's say that we wanted to attach like a cube and the cube should be, um, what we, uh, what's a good way of saying this? I want the cube to, I'm still snap. Uh, I want the cube to be kind of stuck on it, but be stuck on it in more of a, uh, like this is a flat plate here. And I don't want to just stick it to one point. I kind of want a point here and a point here, or we're connecting it, let's say, to four points. I'm only going to do two, but let's say you connected it on four different points. These are things that I think we can do. So, uh, but what, we're just going to connect down two. So we've got this red, and let's go and make a copy of red, and we're going to name this one blue. And we'll make a blue material, just so we can be very clear, very explicit. And let's put this on blue. And now I'm going to go to the dynamics or the constraint tag. Uh, I'm going to go to clamp. I'm going to say, don't lock your position. And I'm going to zero out the rotation. And I'm going to move it straight up to wherever. Let's just say right onto that point, approximately right onto that point. And once again, lock the position. So now we've got two different objects and they're both locked onto there. So this is the beginnings of a small rig for us. Well, we wouldn't actually render those red and, and blue. You could just think of those as nulls right now. But if we were to make, um, let's go ahead and push our rig a little bit further. Actually, I'm going to move the red one below and let's make a null. I'm going to make the null a child of red, and I'll zero out the position on X and Z, and I'm going to move it up into the air a little bit. So this is going to be a pivot point here. So even I'm going to go ahead and rename it PIV for PIV, and that we would make a we'd make the rectangle a child of that. And now let's also make a ch let's copy PIV and delete the cube, and I'm going to zero this out. Not on Y, but on X here. So now there's also a null inside of the blue one. It's actually up a little bit, which is fine. And I'm just going to call this aim. So now that is something for it to aim at. But I think we also probably need an up vector. So I'm going to copy piv one more time. I don't need the cube. It's just a way of getting the null. And let's call this up. And now up, I'm going to hold down shift and just move it up whatever number of units. I'm going to move it up 50 units, OK? So now we got pivot. So you can see pivot is aiming up, the Y is up, and then our goal, our aim, is on negative X. Oh, X is positive right now, but we want negative X. So let's go ahead and add a new constraint tag to that. I'm going to add a character constraint. We'll go to clamp, no, not clamp. I don't want to clamp. I want to aim. So what are we aiming? Well, we already said it out loud. Uh, we want to aim our negative X at aim. Boop. Now you see nothing changed because we built this correctly so far. Now, what do we want? What else do we want? We want an up vector. This up vector is moving wherever red moves, but that gives us a good forward direction. So we can go back to basic and we can turn on up vector. Now we go to up vector, we have two settings we need. We need the up vector, which is y plus 
which is correct. But we also need our axis, and that should be whatever our aim was. So our aim was negative x, so I'm going to say negative x. And now we drag in our up on that. Now visually, nothing should change. But what should happen with any luck here is when we hit play, oop, actually, I just remembered one thing. We do need to rewind and tell this to also calculate really late. So I have to say generators and crank it to the full number. And it's physically later than the other two, so it will calculate after the other two. Um, so now, now there shouldn't be a frame of lag on our plate. Uh, let's go ahead and drag a normal material onto our plate here. And now the idea is, is this plate is going to be stuck onto our surface here, and it's going to be aiming wherever that does. Now, you see there is, actually was a little twitch there when this kind of tilted suddenly from one side to the other. So we've got a couple of potential limitations there, but I'm going to temporarily turn off the visibility of both blue and red. And now we've got a plate which is sticking not just to that surface, but it's also kind of clamped to two different points here. Um, so uh, now our up vector aim there is definitely like a little bit twitchy. We could say that we could, you know, potentially we could just grab this aim, this up. I could say, no, up, I want you to be on blue and not this other one. I can zero at the X and Z. And now it's directly above there. We got some random rotation. Um, yeah, these are spinning, which is a little bit of a pain. But uh, we don't care about the spinning because we're aiming at two different points that are stuck onto the surface. So the aim on the blue is hopefully a little more solid. Um, not, not saying we could necessarily get some twisting on there, but that is also now locked onto those two separate points, giving us more of a, uh, more of a direction. Now you could, there, we could definitely start building more complex rigs. Like, uh, the most stable configuration would be a triangle where you could do three points and aim, aim one at the next and the next at the next. And now you've kind of got this absolute flat triangle, which is a, a triangle is a way of representing an infinite plane. Um, so yeah, that is, but, but this is now stuck there and to whatever degree we want to push it in or out and bend it, uh, we have pretty good control over that. And, uh, yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy with that overall. I mean, it does end up being twitchy, but it's only as twitchy as our, um, points are on, uh, linked on there. So that's just by the nature of the soft bodies. Um, uh, so that's one methodology. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other obvious way of doing it. Um, you can use springs. Springs have some limitations. I would be a little bit curious. Uh, what time is it? Um, we're almost exactly at four. Um, so why don't we spend a few minutes on it and then maybe I'll sneak in one extra question just for fun. Um, so... Uh, what is the best? I think keeping this a, a rectangle is probably a good idea. Um, so that is saved as that version. But let's go ahead and save it as a B. And then we'll call this one um, Springs. Springs. Uh, now, the, uh, this one's going to be hopefully not too much more complicated setup. I'm going to delete all of the kind of existing rig stuff. Um, this one... It might be a little harder to set up, but the advantage is that it would be dynamically connected, which would be a big advantage. Um, in fact, I want this to be very precise in the way we're going to connect it. So I'm going to actually delete out that cube. I'm going to make a copy of our plane, delete the dynamics tag, make this editable. And we're going to very, very cleanly uh, grab whatever we're going to connect. Let's say it's that. This is what is going to be our connection, okay? So I'm going to hit uh, UI invert. Um, select all, D for extrude, create a cap, give it some thickness, select all, uh, there we go, perfect, um, looking good, and now we'll just change the color to blue, uh, okay, and this will be our, uh, I guess I'll just say plate, and we need to start linking it. Now, the advantage of the, doing this extrude is all my points are pretty much perfectly lined up. Uh, we are going to make this dynamic. Uh, and let's see if we just say uh, simulation rigid body. Uh, I just want to see if this kind of explodes or does anything bad. No, it's fine. Um, it kind of may, might pop away from it a little bit. But let's see if we can get some springs working. Um, we'll start with just one as well. So I'm going to go simulation dynamics spring. What is the spring going to link to? The spring is going to go in between these two. It is going to link the plane. And let's do this one right away. Uh, I want to link to the plane. What do I want to link to? I want to link to a 
a polygon point. Now we could do a point selection and make four selections, but I tend to just do it directly on the index. So I'm just going to start dragging this through and we can see it traveling through all of our points. And now we can see that it's traveling around and right there it is point 205. And now let's also link it to our plate and do the same thing. I want to link it to a polygon point and we just have to toggle through all of these until it is a perfect flat loop or completely disappears right there completely disappears that means it's on the exact same position it has a scale of zero so that is a spring of no position cool it has a rest length of set rest length zero um so that is that's another way of checking actually I never thought about that but if you hit set rest length and it's zero then that means they are indeed in the same spot so we can just call this spring one let's go and make a copy and we'll let's just make all four at the same time why not so spring two i'm going to start ticking through and i can see that is now on the next one and now i can start ticking through on the other one which i think i have to go down 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 there we go back to zero nice and so now we make spring three this is going nice and quick i thought it would take longer um so let's start here let's start increasing our index it's going to have to loop around a few times there we go now we're here tick there we go it's right on that one and now we'll have to start i don't know if we have to increase or decrease i'm just going to start cycling through almost nope not quite there we go zero again set rest length you see it's correct one more spring four spring four uh increase 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 there we go and increase 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 uh we might even cycle around all the way um we might loop all the way through the points and get back to the beginning uh and that's fine it just loops around there we go. Uh, so it's 64. I imagine this also potentially zero. Yeah, so it's also zero. 64 points on here or zero. So there we go. We got four springs, four connections, all set to zero. So uh, I'm going to hit save, and let's just see what happens without changing any settings. Everything's default. We just have four springs. Hit play. You know what? Not too bad. That is sticking on there pretty well. But here's the advantage. It's also dynamic. So with this being dynamic... Um, it's not passing through and it's actually being pulled on all four points. So can, now let's start tink tinkering with this a little bit more. You see that our springs, they are definitely stretching. So we can start doing some additional things. We can add some spring stiffness. So I can add, set this to 10. St our, uh, I can't change the number while it's playing. So let's set that to 11. Uh, let's hit play and it's still stable. Now what's kind of cool here is depending on the how well this works, this could also be pulling the points of the cloth to the object. So the two are actually in conjunction with each other. So uh, if we push these too far, they will explode. But um, yeah, okay, so boom, explode. Uh, and in fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell the plates dynamics. I'm going to say, don't worry about self collisions. That's going to make it so even if it explodes, it doesn't slow us down too much. Actually, surprisingly, kind of, oh, let's actually do it on the right object. Um, even if this explodes now, you see it's not slowing us down because it's the self collisions that actually cause the slowdown. So now it's really strong, but it's so strong that's causing an explosion where those start freaking out. So don't want that. But uh, even at, at that strength of 111, if we hit uh, control D and go to our dynamic settings, we might be able to crank up our steps per frame. So let's jump it up to 55 and that could work. Hit play, it falls down. Um, he's getting all flappy in there and then it's not self colliding anymore. So, um, that's being a little, it, the way it's overlapping is being a little weird, but the strength it didn't explode, but you can definitely see we're getting some weird behavior. I'm going to go ahead and turn on self collisions again, and we'll be careful here. Um, so that's going to pull down. Yeah, it's red, man. There's almost like a gravitational force on that. Um, I wonder if there's an influence. That is a thing. Uh, damping. Yeah. See region of influence. That could be trouble. Region of influence is how many points around it does it do something with and it looks like it has a minimum of one percent but let's see if this is any different it's definitely different that's yeah, better um so now you can see we've got this incredible stiffness and you see these this cloth is being forced to practically be like on top of it it does seem to be confusing the ones around it but the only point here being is 111 maybe a little strong let's drop it to half the amount and hit play and already a little bit more reasonable and it's stuck there pretty dang well uh it's probably stuck there well enough that we don't need 55 calculations every frame so at uh, 25 it seems to be doing just fine let's drop it to 15 
Uh, we're at near, near real time now, and it seems to be sticking just fine. This, this methodology is working quite well. I'm quite pleased with it. And if you needed to, you could probably even make a couple additional points where you could connect all of the points to it, and it could just potentially be working. Um, so yeah, uh, there you go. Two different methodologies for connecting one thing to another. I mean, there are definitely limits. If this thing suddenly decided to move really quick, it's entirely possible it would just explode and go flying away. Uh, and this region of influence, I do feel like there is some, there is some thing happening down here in this bottom one that's a little strange. Uh, and I don't, I, I wish we could make this region of influence a zero or even just one or like point one. But it seems like one is a minimum. Uh, we also got our damping. I don't know if we need any damping. That's just sucking energy out from the system. But I don't think it's springy enough for that to be a variable. Um, and then even the stiffness. Like, we, we crank the stiffness up, but this should be... The lower it is and it's still working, the better it's going to be for you. So if we drop this down to 25, then it's not pulling as strong. It's not going to be as twitchy. Um, and I think it just calms everything down. So, yeah, I think that's a fine setup. All right, I'm going to jump into the chat and see if there's any more questions. I do want to throw out here a couple things while I've got everybody. And then we're going to take one more question. So repost your links. At the bottom, I will choose from the bottom again. Uh, recapping a couple quick things. Tomorrow is a bonus live stream. Uh, the bonus live stream is for people who are supporting on Patreon at a particular level, uh, at like $10 and above. The point being is on the long, on the bonus stream, what we're going to be doing is longer form projects. Uh, we voted on a project and we're going to be doing sand effects. We already did a week of exploration and tomorrow is going to be more exploration. Eventually I'm going to be trying to make like a little, a little animation of some sort and, and it might be multiple shots. It might be a little, a tiny five second short film. Uh, something small, but something cool and finally animated. We're playing with third-party renders. We're playing with X-Particles, a bunch of different things. So if you want to come and hang out and see these projects kind of early on in every step of the way, then please go check out Patreon for that. And even just Patreon in general, um, the idea for Patreon is that for all the live streams and the upcoming tutorials, this is just helping me produce these things and keep them free for everybody. So even this bonus live stream tomorrow, if you can't be a part of it, then that's completely fine and... Uh, eventually the cool final animation will be out there. Any cool tutorials that come from it will be out there for free for everybody. Uh, but then there's also like the engineer level on Patreon and you get all the scene files. Everything you've seen me save, you would get that file. You can dissect it, keep it for later. And personally for me, uh, the best way I learn is through reverse engineering. So those scene files would be incredibly valuable to me. Um, so if you're uh, watching on Twitch, you can just scroll down. You can see a button to Patreon if you want to support. Uh, it's appreciated, but not necessary at all. It's just a co cool, fun thing. Uh, and I super appreciate it. Um, and then uh, other news. Uh, I'm going to make a special button for it down below. But um, Crossfader put a link in the chat for uh, rocketlassoslack.com. When we have the next version of the website ready, it's going to be a community page. But for right now, go to rocketlassoslack.com to continue the conversation. Bunch of helpful people in there hanging on Slack, answering questions, just showing off projects. There's cool group project. There's going to be an upcoming chain project um, based around the Rocket Lasso logo, just because that's what people are asking for. Um, a lot of fun stuff going on there. So uh, that should be everything I want to mention here. So I'm going to jump back into the chat and tackle one more question. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Motion process. Thanks, dude. Uh, Dim, thank you very much. Uh, Zalam's got a link. I'm trying to see if there's anybody with a link that I haven't clicked on recently, but let's do Zalam. Um, Oh, and he, this is even somebody asked about this question earlier, so it's not even specifically your question, but thank you for keeping an eye out for people. Let's drag this on over into the proper window. So this is Pasha Ho. We've definitely tackled some of his stuff in the past. Um, so either the same people online are making cool stuff that you guys are always interested in, or you need to start following more people on Instagram so we can get start showcasing more varied artists. But let's just see what he's got going on here because I'm sure it's cool again. Whoa. Wow. Um, okay, well, we've got a bunch of real... Okay. Um, oh, it's super interesting. Okay, now, uh, if we scroll up here, we're going to see that he is probably going to use the word Python in here. Yes, he does indeed use the word Python. Um, so 
um, there is a methodology for this kind of thing. We, we talked about something very similar to this last week, but the way he's applying it is completely different, and that's super interesting. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any... Uh, there's not a quick way. First of all, he did do this in Python, so there is a level of like, okay, there's code that's driving the way this is subdividing. Um, now, um, I, I'm trying to think of... Like, he did it with code, and last week we... We kind of faked it pretty well with a grid, and I was pretty happy with that. But this rig is significantly more complex in the way that he's letting it run. Um, so let me, um, I don't even know if I have it on this computer. Let me do a quick search for a file. Uh, I should be able to find it somewhere on Dropbox. And let me just see if I'm gonna search for the word grid maker. And this is something I coded a long time ago um, in Python, and it never got released. And I'd, I'd have to start stuff from conceptually from scratch again if I was ever going to do something with it. Uh, oh, and it seems like I did find it. Um, but I'm just going to talk through it a little bit. So let's see if this works. Oh, this isn't... That's not what I thought it was at all. Um, okay, here it is. No. This is... This has been made editable. That's not quite it either. Let me check the enclosing folder. Oh, uh, how do I open up the folder it's in? Yeah, I'm looking at this and I'm not sure how to open up the enclosing folder. Um, but let's go in there. Grid maker. There we go. Okay, here we go. So this is what I wanted to show you. So now, first of all, there is lots of code to make this happen. So not a trivial thing. But conceptually, what is happening is there's a there's a bunch of space here and it's getting subdivided a bunch of times. So if I were to, this one is, is three dimensional, but if I were to make it very thin, then you can kind of conceptually see what's happening. And what's happening is as there's additional cuts being made, it is subdividing the cuts in different ways. And now you can see it's always eating up that same space. So you can see already here a similarity between the way these are being formed. And uh, if I were to change my random offset here, you're going to see things moving around. Now, it, it, this is not the same code. It's not the same kind of conceptual thing that was built in in Pasha's animation. But if I, instead of having this just be pure randomness, if I had a noise driving these, then these different segments could be blobbing up and down, having different thicknesses. So the only thing I can do right here is show you different random seeds, and you can see how they're moving around. Um, but, um, but then you just imagine that the code is returning like a start and end point on everything, and then you could use those to drive things. So the width of this is what is being driv driving the width of the pencil. It's determining the, the head here. And then the height is just taking whatever that extra space is and stretching the bottom out to match it is conceptually what's going on. Um, now, we don't have any way of essentially making this type of motion in vanilla Cinema 4D. Not, in no way can I think of a way of of having a series of planes with offsetting things without us going deep into Expresso. We would need like a bunch of segments being determined. So I, I just cannot conceptually think of a way to do this outside of code, outside of what we did last week. And we'll pop that open real quick just because it was interesting. Um, so in the scene files from last week, we had... Uh, these uh, these techno screens, and if you, if you look at the way that these are going to be kind of moving, and you can kind of see like how we're faking it, like you can see how it's kind of like we've got a vertical series and a horizontal variable, and as these are independently scaling up and down, dynamics is wanting them to fall in, and if you weren't here last week, there's wind blowing them left and down and backwards, so they're kind of being trapped in the corner of a big box. And you can kind of see the way that they're piling up. So conceptually, this is the only other way I can think of doing something kind of like this, so potentially if you did uh, like all the dynamics in a very particular way, um, you might be able to get a stack of things going in this kind of concept. Um, but it'd be starting to get so specific. And once again, like, like last week, we had to build this entire elaborate rig to make it work. Um, what we'd have to do here uh, would be... And then even that, like, I guess we could build the rig, but it's like, if we were to make a block here, and let's see if we can... 
Um, I just want to make sure that they're not going to fall in the corner. If I do do that and we were to make this just regular dynamic, you're going to see rigid body. This is just going to fall backwards and into the corner. So if we were to make this randomly scaling left and right and up and down, and we could do that with Grayscale Gorilla's plug-in signal. So I could drive the size here and I could be randomly adding a noise. Then I can say I want to randomly change on Y and I want to randomly change on Z. And then X, I want it to not change at all, so I'll do zero. So now you can see that these are going to be stretching up and down and doing stuff. And we'd probably want to slow it down, 0.25 speed. And then you can see it's it's now changing height and width. So that is all good. But what we'd have to do is make a stack of these. So copy and paste and put one above. And I have to do this very precisely on Y. Now I could, yeah, I can I can go and make this one a different height. I could say the base height of this one can be a smaller. And I could copy and paste this top one, this bottom one, and move it up. So you see we got a stack of three. And now all three of these, let's turn on subdivision so we can, or our N B so we can see our edges. So now you can see we've got one box in the corner, one box there, one box there. And I can even go and change the, um, I can't change the, right? Okay. This is where it starts getting complicated. If I hit play, these are uniformly in their own relative way, scaling up on Y and down on Z. And all the gravity is forcing them to go. So we could build potentially if we made a rig like a pencil or a pen or a Wacom pen that was stretching to match these scales, then this would be a rig that could do it in vanilla cinema. We'd have to be copying and pasting again and again and again and again. And again. Um, so that'd be neat. And even here you can see that th these are not perfectly staying on each other because we are relying on dynamics to force them down. So we'd have to like crank these winds even higher. But you know, as soon as we do that, we start getting like twitchiness. So you can see we get like these little twitches. So there's a push and pull on that. Um, but you can see how these would stack. And then we'd have to put different random seat. We'd have to do one randomness on X, so one signal tag potentially. There's other ways. You can just use noise and espresso, uh, but it'd be very manual to do. But if they all, this entire stack would have to have the same X, the same horizontal, but then you have all different random seeds on Y, and then you would make a different copy. I'm going to copy and paste the entire stack over here, and now they're in the same order. I guess, okay, in order to visually differentiate, I'm just going to make an extra copy of this one. So there's two there, so at least they're different. So now these four would all get the same different seed. So they do have a different seed, and now they'll all stack up there. So you can see these are all doing, <laughs> well, we've lost that one, but these are all doing the same thing. So they have the same Z, and they have different Y than that one. So you can see how we could kind of dynamically build that. That is not how that was done. Uh, Pasha's was made with code, but you can kind of conceptually see how this concept might work. Uh, I'll go ahead and save this one in the new file because it's neat. Um, of course, you won't be able to really open up the file and play with it unless you have Grayscale Real Signal, but I do love that plugin. So if you don't have it, you should have it. Um, so we'll just make this number seven. And we'll see if there's a quickie, quickie question, because I didn't really get to answer that one. I just kind of got to talk through it conceptually. Uh, hmm, stacking boxes. Dynamic. I guess it's just dynamic. Back to the chat. Hey, everybody. That's the link from last week. Yep, that was great. Uh, <laughs> Yada Glow saying, make a banana. Um, you know what? That's not a that's not a terrible idea. I'll make. I'll, we can model a banana really quick because we you saw the uh, you saw the reference here when we started. We had this fruit morph, and I did make this banana, and it's really fun to do this kind of thing. So uh, let's just even see if we can sort of make, we'll, we'll use this one as a visual reference because I was looking at a bunch of photos of banana. I might even, you know, there's always bananas in the house. So I probably was just using one as a visual reference. Um, but let's go ahead and see if we can um, model up, model up one. I'm gonna copy this, close the file, open up a new file, paste this in. This is purely going to be a reference off to the side, but keep in mind what I said about the initial model. Um, now, I'm pretty sure when I had modeled the first one here, I had started with a um, an, an apple. I just thought the I knew I, I could if I had the apple, I knew I could morph the apple into a banana. But I wasn't sure if I made a banana, I could morph it into the apple. So I started with what I thought was the most difficult. Um, but here we're just starting with a banana. But let's still treat it like we were going to be morphing it here. Um, so. Um, couple things we could do. First of all, if we wanted to get a round shape, and I don't know how many segments around, so we're probably not going to be identical here. But let's go and make this like five by five by five. So we've got an odd number here, and then I could go and make a uh, spherical 
deformer, which is very spherified. Drop that in, and I crank that up. And now you see, boom, we've got a nice sphere, very even. Now, I think one of the preset spheres actually comes pretty close to this. Let's find out. If I go here, if we change this to a hex hexhedron, I think, yeah, you can see it's actually practically identical. But conceptually, you can even see how this might have gotten coded. Yeah, there we go. If I do this, it's almost the same. But can we get an odd number? Yeah, we're, we're okay, right there. That's the same shape. So, but even that, I feel like that's not as spherical as that one is. It feels a little squished. But regardless, we've got a uh, we've got our shape here. I can just right click and say current state to object. Uh, now we are going to be adding some extra polygons on here. I'm not going to be shy about that. But that seems to be working okay. So uh, the first thing I would do is obviously our overall shape is taller. So it's T for scale. And actually, let's not even do T for scale. I want the top part to be relatively flat. So I'm going to do a loop here, and let's do U F, and we'll grab that and hit E. For move, I'm gonna move up, and I'm just eyeballing this. So, and I'm gonna grow my selection. E for up, grow again. E, grow. Make sure I grab the Y, stretch it up, grow, stretch it up. And now you see how we're stretching out, but we, we maintained this rounder shape on the bottom here. Now that we've done, oop, I just increased the speed of my mouse. Um, I grab this bottom one, grow, grow. I don't want those ones in the corner, but this one, maybe I pull that down a little bit further. And then you see, and you can even see that. Look, I, I, I'm, I don't remember how I modeled this one specifically, but you can already see this one little shape emerge right there. So that's a very similar shape. And now we could grab this bottom one, pull that down, and then you can see we're getting pretty good curvature here for the overall shape. Now it does look like that the overall banana would be skinnier here. So I'm going to hit T for scale, not turn off Y, and I can just scale that in. Grow my selection, scale that in. Grow my selection, scale that in. There we go, a little bit more of a uniform shape overall. And then let's do the same thing up here. Grow the selection, grow the selection. Don't want that or that or that or that. Pull it up. Shrink, pull it up. And there we go. Got a basic little kind of corn on the cob. We could morph in the corn as well. Um, now, actually, that I don't want to go too far there because you see the, the way the banana is shaped there. It actually scales down. Now, right there is we could pro potentially have a couple extra slices in here, more subdivisions. You can see that this one definitely has more subdivisions in the base. This is more of a low poly one. But uh, here I could go T for scale, scale this up. Oop, turn Y back on. T for scale, scale it up, move it back down again. And I can hit I for inner extrude. Now let's inner extrude that a little bit and pull it up a little bit. And I can hit D for extrude, and we'll pull that up a little bit. T for scale, go down a little. D extrude we'll extrude that up t for scale scale it out a little bit d for extrude go up just that little bit and then probably an i will pull that in and pull it down a little bit so there we go we got, kind of get this very basic version of the overall shape and we might need some extra subdivisions in fact i'd probably be inclined to do an extra cut in here so grab that ub mf one cut turn off end gons you see i get a nice cut right through the middle ul t for scale scale that down just make it a little bit more of a curve traveling through it's looking fine. I think we'd probably need to kind of scale this entire thing up vertically a little more. So T for scale, scale the whole thing up. Um, and that's work, working pretty well. And now uh, I would not be shy about using a bend deformer to get some of this curvature in. Let's go ahead and drop a bend in. And I'm going to say unlimited. And now if we start bending it, and let's go ahead and change our angle to 90. Um, so now we didn't even have to scale it to match the overall shape. And you can see we can start bending this in. And we get a little bit of a nice overall curve. But most bananas don't have like a straightforward curve on the entire thing. So we'll make a second bend. In fact, the second one will calculate before the first one. And I can say it's not unlimited. Let's just go limited. And now I can take this one and pull it up further. And as this one bends, we might want to stretch it up taller. And keep in mind, it's almost like this first one isn't happening yet. So this one is just doing whatever's happening up here. So this one, we can increase the strength here and bend that. And if we wanted to, we could even stretch it up taller still and pull it up. So it's only bending the top half of this banana. But now it's going to bend the stem as well. And now when we use the second bend, it's going to bend everything. And that top part is essentially getting double bent. Um, and then we could just keep layering those up and up. I can add a second one up there. And let's make it nowhere near as tall. So it's going to be way skinny. And keep in mind, this one is, once again, calculating first. So I can move it up. And then it's like, where do I want the extra bend to go? So it's like, okay, maybe something a little sharper right there would work. And then I could, it might be good to say keep Y length here. So it's not going to keep stretching the banana out. So I can stretch it there, bend that. And then this one, and even these, maybe keep Y length. Um, maybe keep Y length. And yeah, it's, just, it's stretching it less. I don't know, some of those I actually kind of liked it bending. And, you know, there's no, nothing is right, 
you know, everything, nothing here is right or wrong unless you think it looks good. Um, so I think this one should bend maybe a little bit less. But yeah, you get that kind of a sharp turn in there. Pull this down. Yeah, there we go. I kind of like that crook a little bit sharper. Um, and yeah, now I got all of those. I could just right click and go current site to object. Uh, I, I would probably keep the previous one here so I could go back to his reference. Keep that up top. What I typically do when I'm modeling something is actually just make a null. I just pull it down here and I hide the null. And as I kind of do those current state to objects, I just drop it as a child there so I don't have to keep on turning off the dots and they just kind of live in this dead folder. Uh, and then we just keep going further and further, getting more and more segments on this banana. And it, at this point, it'd just be kind of like, hey, what, what doesn't have enough detail or what is, uh, you know, just not quite right. Like here, this is this curvature. I don't like that too much. I grab that polygon, grow, R for rotate, spin, grow, R for rotate, T for scale, scale that overall thing bigger, grow, R for rotate, spin it a little, E for move, scoot this down, keep the curve going. Um, you know, and it's just a little bit of cleanup overall here. Uh, that's all working pretty well. This this geometry here looks a little sharp. Uh, it's not necessarily wrong, but I could grab those at MG for iron and just let those smooth themselves out a little bit. Um, and at this point, it's like, okay, that's, this seems like about as far as I can go without checking in a subdivision surface. You know, there's still certain things. I could grab these polygons. Let's pull those out, make that a little bit more square right there. Um, yeah, it's still pretty skinny, so pull that up. Yeah. Grab that middle one. Grow. Grow. Scoot. Yeah, so stuff like that. Um, anyway, here you see that curvature is continuing, but over there on the original reference, like it clearly wasn't bent that much. So when we were bending those, maybe we should have been counter bending them back a little, honestly. So I can go up, R for rotate, grow, pull it up. So yeah, that's just kind of that. Now we make a subdivision surface. We throw the whole thing in there and see what the overall shape is looking like. You know what? That's not too bad. That's not too bad considering we weren't looking at it at all in that capacity. Now, a, an important feature on a banana is that you get some areas of sharpness, although we are sort of getting those already. The, uh, do you see how we are, because it's kind of, it was maintaining a slightly boxier shape? The, uh, there's not a curvature here that I would think. So essentially, you see that, you see how we're getting almost like this slightly harder edge? And bananas kind of have like, I don't know how many, like six, five, six, seven of these little, extra hard segments. Now we could emphasize one of those or pull them out more by grabbing those edges. I could grab, actually let's hit, uh, what is it, UM? Yeah, UM is the path selection tool. So I could go and trace along that edge on the banana. And then now we have to be very careful about moving this, but if we just move that back and out a little bit, then we're gonna I'm really emphasize that curve right there, that sharp part. And now let's just say we wanted to add one right down here in the middle stripe of the banana we can go and hit UM. Now we don't actually have a subdivision right down the middle, so that's actually a limitation. And we could subdivide the entire model one time and now get that. But let's go ahead and just drag a path through there. And now we'd have to grab this and just pull it down and out a little bit, maybe T for scale and scale it down a little bit. Um, but now you can see how, do you see how we know we've now got that little stripe traveling down there? We haven't added any extra geometry, but we are adding in these extra little banana type subdivisions in there. Um, and, but then let's say we didn't want that. Let's say this one is, let's say we wanted one here, you know, let's say we were going to put one here and we we're going to put one also here, but that means this one is getting in the way. So what we could do is grab that one and start smoothing it out more MG for smooth and then let that smooth itself out, grow the selection one, smooth it out a little more, but not as much. And that's what I tend to do is grow my selection smooth, like half the amount I did the time before, but now now look now if I scroll around we kind of look at this highlight look at that highlight is not there actually it did a pretty good job it did better than I thought it would um, it, that highlight is now no longer there the way it had been so now we are free to go hit um and grab whatever we actually want the little standout section to be so E for move again let's scoot that entire thing out and you see I don't move very far just move that little bit. And here I'd probably hit T for scale and scale it out a little bit more, just a little bit to maintain the overall radius. 
And now with any luck, yeah, now you get that lump right there. So it worked exactly the way I was hoping it would. So even with this, this, this banana is lower poly than even that one. And we are able to do a pretty dang good job of bending that out. And that's pretty good that considering that that banana started out as a cube. So I am going to wrap this one up right there. Let's go ahead and give this one a, uh, uh, a quick save as just that banana right there. And let's name this number one. But, oh, I guess I shouldn't have deleted that null. The null can stay. Um, boop, 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 number eight. Modeling a banana. Banana. Cool. Okay, that was fun. That was a that was a good question. Thank you, that yada clue. Um, so everybody, um, that was fun. Um, oh yeah, and then also Andrew mentions that we could play with subdivision weight as well, and we are doing that in the second question of today. So that could also be applied to pull that in. Um, I it, it, in the case when I had modeled those different fruits, it was to morph them between each other, and I don't know if you can morph the subdivision weight at the same time. So I that would be a reason not to do that. But uh, but th definitely definitely that's a variable you could go. Um, yeah, Sphere Factory. We'll save that one for next week. He's asking about peeling the banana off there. Hit me separately on that. We'll see if maybe there's something to tackle. We could continue off of this one since we have two different banana model models now. Um, the uh, let's see. Uh, Sphere Factory. I'm also agree that the uh, the the tip here is a little bit sharp. Maybe. We could uh, could have uh, you know sharpened that up a little bit, especially by grabbing this and like pulling a little bit closer to a corner, perhaps, or pulling the entire thing uh, further in, or maybe the overall shape on the tip there just needs to be uh, like pinched in more, so you get a sharper angle. So there's a lot of different things to like vary that up. I actually like that less, but um, but yeah, there's definitely a million tweaks to go in there. But that's as far as I'm going to go on that. Oh, wait, I guess I was just showing that without flipping the screen, but yeah, it still looks like that. Um, do, 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 um, uh, Leo is asking if there'd be a way of doing, well, essentially, would there be a way of linking to a project? So instead of asking a question, because right now people are typing out a question or linking to like an Instagram or something inspirational they saw on Twitter. But Leo is asking if it'd be possible to, um, ask a question via like a scene file. Um, I guess that is potentially possible, but that's dangerous because, um, it's dangerous because I just don't know what you're, what's going to be sent. And a lot of people don't prepare files very well. Um, cause you know, I've done years and years and years of tech support and oftentimes people will send a file, but they won't attach the images or they'll send it with a gig of baked material or baked, uh, animation on it or there's missing plugins is a huge one where it's like oh they used octane but i don't have octane so i can't even i can't do anything with the file octane just keeps yelling again and again and again that you don't have it, it takes forever to, to do it so the, while i want to say that that's possible it does seem like an avenue where there's a lot of danger a lot of things could get messed up via that route so for right now i'm thinking probably not but as uh it is being pointed out by pro tools jump into rocket last the rocket lasso slack and that's the perfect place for everybody to help answer questions. Um, and then even potentially that'd be a good place where it's like, hey, this would become, I don't know, I, I don't want to make anything official, but it could go in there. It's like, hey, this should be a question for Rocket Lasso Live. So via going to the Slack, it can be put in there. People can look at it and it can get verified as like, okay, this is clean. It's ready to be sent out. Really, when you're sending a question on that kind of level, you should strip out everything that isn't relevant to the question so that they can work from the purest, cleanest, simplest form. If I open up a file and there's a hundred different objects, but you only have a question about one little tiny one, the first thing I'm going to do is copy and paste that object out of that file into a new one. So that would be something there. Um, but yes, uh, there's the link again in the uh, Rocket Lasso Slack. And uh, be sure to go and hang out there. People are really great at answering questions and hanging out there. And I'm in there too. Um, so yeah, we got a lot of people hanging out in the chat here. Everybody had really great questions. Uh, does everybody who is still here, do you like, um, I personally, I do like a mix, but 
uh, I think we've been lacking at doing kind of these rapid fire ones. And there's a big advantage, I think, to doing these rapid fire ones. Where it's like, let's just do this tiny little part of the question. And then this time we answered like six or seven different questions instead of just doing one question. And sometimes doing the one question is fun, but sometimes doing a bunch of little ones is more fun. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I was actually chatting with, uh, Lucas a little bit about this, um, last week where if somebody's, you know, a lot of people are like at lunch right now or they're watching while they're working. And if I'm doing a two hour long project, it's kind of hard to follow along if you're not in the mode to do that. But if I'm doing some quick modeling thing in 10 minutes, that's pretty easy to pay attention to. So, uh, so I do like this and we'll be doing this, this style a lot more. We'll be making sure there's a very healthy mix of doing the more rapid fire ones for sure. Uh, but in any case, I believe that this is going to officially wrap it up. Thanks again, everybody for jumping in here and asking the questions. We couldn't do it without you. We even got to do two just written questions. That's really fun. Uh, I'm excited about that. Uh, once again, check out the Patreon below if you're on Twitch, uh, helping out there. It helps me out a whole bunch, keeps it so I can do these more often. And that will officially wrap this one up. Thank you, everybody, and I'm going to officially go now. Bye-bye. See you on the Slack channel. Bye-bye-bye-bye-bye-bye. Bye-bye-bye.